Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the picturesque surroundings of Road America for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. This is a place and this area that is steeped in racing, road racing. Back in 1950, there were races on the public roads, and for five or six years, that is how the people here did their competition, and they brought in teams and drivers from all over the states and all over the world. But that was not tenable. With increased safety standards being required, it became quite obvious to the locals that what they needed to have was a permanent circuit. What they built was something that absolutely represented the roads around the area and replicated the same kind of challenges that they'd seen in those long open road races of the early 1950s. Hello, everybody. I'm John Heindorf. Jeremy Shaw is with me in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre, and we're getting ready for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship for the IMSA Sports Car Weekend at Road America, Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, about an hour or so up the road from Milwaukee, super part of the world. The back roads around here are really nice, and there's plenty of ways to cut back and forth around the track. 14 corners, just over four miles around. Action areas for overtaking uh, at turn one. Down the hill, tricky braking and some new racing surface there at turn five. Under the bridge towards, uh, and then uh, down the hill towards turn eight before the carousel leads you into that long downhill run to Canada Corner. Very little runoff down there with the concrete barriers very close. Canada Corner, yep, yeah, that's an overtaking spot as well. But also at the turn 14 and the long climb to the start finish line, that's also an opportunity. If you get a really good run, you can maybe take a position even before you trip the timing line at the end of the race. Well, the cars are out on the circuit. If you're just joining us, welcome along. Uh, and we're live in sound and vision via imsaradio.com. Obviously, that's where the audio is, but also the live video button there if you're outside the US. If you're inside the US, Brian Till will be taking you through all of the action on NBCSN. That comes along on tape delay at 8 Eastern tonight. Very busy day of motorsport for NBCSN. Brian heading up the team, 8 Eastern. We're on 87.9 FM around the track, along with our scanner frequency, 454, and XM Sirius, XM202 as well, for full flag-to-flag -flag coverage. Jeremy Shaw, Porsche keys to the race. We talked about them in our Michelin countdown to green. This racetrack, four miles around, that's three or nearly four times longer than some of the tracks that we've been to, I think particularly of, of Lime Rock Park. Here, you've got to get your strategy absolutely right and your fuel numbers are an essential part of that. You're not coasting into the pit lane here. You're not, you're not coasting into the pit lane here, being uphill all the way from Canada Corner. It's been a part of a mile from the uh, from, from your pit stall. So it, it is absolutely crucial. And uh, yeah, the, the, the teams are going to be keeping a wary eye on the skies as well. And that shit, Adam, is because we have been plagued by Mother Nature, just giving us a little elbow and letting us know who's boss. What's the situation with the forecast this afternoon? No precipitation for the next 90 minutes, or at least it's highly unlikely per my weather radar map. Uh, there are little spots starting to appear to the south of the track, and the motion is heading to the northeast, though. We are most likely going to be getting some rain before the end of this one. And uh, trust me, I'll be giving everybody on the pit lane a fair warning of when they should go put on their rain gear. Share Adam, our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter, will keep us up to date with uh, all of the information from the teams. Good to see you all trackside and back with us again here at Road America. America's national part of Park of Speed has never looked any better, but you don't get uh, all of that greenery around here without some rain. We'll keep our fingers crossed that the sun stays out. Four miles, longest track, also one of the fastest top speeds as well, and one of the fastest lap average speeds on the IMSA calendar, which was announced for 2022, just a couple of days ago in the state of the sport by IMSA president John Doonan. No major changes in the venues, one or two date changes, but glad to say we'll be back here next year so we can look forward to that already. But for right now, 
we're going to fork this in on the next two hours and 40 minutes of action. With Felipe Nazar in the red, number 31, wheel and engineering Cadillac, bringing the field round now that the Corvette C8 has pulled into the pit lane. Our pace car, which will become the safety car if we see it again. On the outside, Paul, it's the Koenig and Minolta Acura of Ricky Taylor, the black and blue number 10. Wait for the green flag. Starter can barely see the pool sitters as they come up. It's Oli Jarvis for Mazda Motorsport and Kevin Magnussen on the second row. And a good jump by the pool sitter. But here comes Ricky Taylor. Wow. Now, did he jump out of line before that as they go side by side round the first corner? And they both go off the track. Certainly, Taylor was all four wheels over the curb there. That might get him a warning. Oli Jarvis looking down the inside. Here comes the GT Le Mans and the GT Daytona cars with the two Corvettes leading the WeatherTech Porsche. WeatherTech very much on home ground. And that car being started by Cooper McNeil. His family very much a part of life around these parts, along with the WeatherTech company. And in GT Daytona, it was Aaron Tielitz for Vassa Sullivan and the RCF GT3, the almost bumblebee transformer-coloured car that was on pole position and is held on to that. In the sunshine, side by side, the 0-1 Cadillac beam slightly hip and shouldered off at turn number six and that was started by Kevin Magnussen who's getting plenty of experience of the rough and tumble of sports car racing since he came to this team he's been successful as well already been his uh, talent being recognized by Peugeot who will be taking him on board next year to help develop the new uh, global prototype hybrid car for them the Peugeot 72 already a pit caller and this year adam was not in the plan for grt grassa racing misha goikberg actually coming to a stop on the first warm-up lap out of the pit lane he did manage to get moving again but brought the car back into the pit both of the front wheels are off i believe this is some kind of a braking issue john oh that is very bad news indeed uh, they have put they are putting the steady jacks underneath that car as they're working underneath it and working on the front end of that car grt and that bright green lamborghini normally one of the main protagonists but you can see that pretty much of everybody in gt daytona uh, to be fair decent start very decent start now, did the number 10 jump out of line? Oh, very, very Ooh. close by Ricky Taylor there. You are not allowed to move out of your line before the start and finish line. We've seen a couple of penalties for that this season already. He was gently ushered off the track to driver's left at the exit of turn one. Shea Adam, there was a bit of a movement, a bit of a wiggle there by Ricky Taylor. Is that enough to draw a penalty? Race control have been very hot on the starting procedures this year. The start is under review, and they will be paying attention to that. He was not in the improper column when they did cross the start line, but the fact that he moved is enough of itself for race control to take another look at that. Kevin Magnussen, the one that less that lost out enough. And start is uh, under review, as she says, that's standard procedure at the start of one of these races. They will look back, not just at the overall start, but also LMP2, which currently has been uh, led by the Power Matheson Motorsports. Paul Sitting, number 52, of Ben Keating. With Dwight Merriman for Aero Motorsport in the blue, number 18 in second. Gar Robinson for Riley Motorsports in the number 74. That's the very bright blue and flame orange. Leisure GSP320, as are all the cars in that class, as he leads from Andretti Autosport, Jared Andretti in second. And in GT Le Mans, it's Corvette Racing, three from four, with Cooper McNeil just a couple of seconds further back. GT Daytona still, uh, still uh, at the head of the field, but not for long. Shea Adam, news of a penalty, but not from the front of the field, from that GTD front row. Oh. From the pole sitter in GTD, changing lanes at the start, drive through for Aaron Tielitz. I'm sorry to all of his friends and family that are out around the circuit. He was starting on the outside of the second row as the GTD pole sitter, and yep, he backed off and fell into line behind Cooper McNeil well before the start finish. That is a massive blow to the Lexus. Uh, that is going to cost him a delta of around about 40 seconds down the pit lane. That's the transit time, but he also will lose time slowing down. 
everybody going past him on the straight. But if you're going to make a mistake, Jeremy, I suppose, do it with two hours and 35 minutes left to make it right. Anything could happen from here. He peels off at the first possible uh, opportunity to serve that drive-through penalty. And I think they've just got to put this behind them now. And effectively, the fight back for that Paul sitting Lexus starts right now. Uh, it, it does, and it, you've got to feel for it, said The problem with this is, of course, there's only three GTLM cars ahead of them. The GT cars are separated from the prototypes, so it's uh, GTLM cars on the front row. Alongside on the second row is the GTLM third-place car and the, the, the pole scissor uh, in GTD, who's on the outside. He's got the other two cars right behind him, but when the uh, GTLM cars accelerate, uh, then that gives the opportunity for somebody to come alongside him. So. You know, I, I hate this uh, th this fact that you, you've got one car on his own out front. You know, it's just a natural reaction to try and defend your position. Normally, there will be another GTD car alongside him, so he couldn't do that. Uh, and having taken the pole position, he should be on the right-hand side of the racetrack, which is the preferred line into turn one. So, uh, you know, but those are the rules, and, and Aaron should know that. Uh, and it was a mistake, but uh, really rather unfortunate. Yeah, effectively, GTD doesn't get its own pole spot. It is the next car in line in the GT category, is what Jeremy's saying there. So, yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, maybe that's something to talk about in our mission of post-race tech, which comes after the chequered flag. That ends the race, but it's only the start of the conversation this weekend. Uh, hashtag IMSA, uh, sorry, uh, at IMSA Radio, hashtag Michelin PRT. Maybe you can come up with an idea to make that a bit easier. We're coming up to eight minutes, having been completed under pleasant conditions uh, at the moment. 26 Celsius in the air, 33 uh, on the track. That's 91 Fahrenheit on track, 79 uh, in the air, if you prefer to do it in those numbers. And leading out, Felipe Nasser from pole position by just half a second to the black and blue, number 10. That's the Acura. Then the white with the red and blue stripes on it. That's the 55 of Ollie Jarvis for Mazda Motorsport. He's just another second further back as they head through the long right-hander of the carousel and down towards the misnomer of the kink, because that isn't the kink at those speeds. That is a proper corner that you've got to line up. You've got to get your turning point spot on and nail that corner, even in these downforce cars. It is flat. There'll be no lift even with full fuel load on those cars. Ollie Jarvis keeping the leaders honest in the smallest displacement cubic capacity car in the DPI class. Just a four-cylinder, two-litre Mazda engine behind Ollie there. Ollie, who's been in the US for quite a long time now, knows his way around the circuits. Good development driver, earned his stripes with Audi. Fortunately for him, just as he was making the move into the big cars after working on the GTs, and graduating up into the prototypes, Audi were forced to withdraw by the VW Group. And he's plied his trade elsewhere. Will be going to Le Mans, though, uh, and is in demand, so that's good news. Of course, he should be. So he's trying to chase these guys down at the, the moment. Quite a lot of interest, uh, IMSA interest here in Le Mans in uh, a couple of three weeks' time. Yeah, a lot of drivers on the grid with IMSA experience and with just under two or 300, excuse me, IMSA wins filling up the grid. We've got 63 drivers, 64 drivers. We have one change uh, this week who have started an IMSA race in 2021 who will be racing at Le Mans. So IMSA experience what? does pay off. 63 drivers who, who have started a race this year in IMSA. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. a third of the We've grid. Before today's race, we have had 218 drivers start an IMSA race. We've bolstered that with today's race by a few. Uh, but 64 of those drivers are going to Le Mans, so almost a third of the drivers who have participated in IMSA this year. Our coverage over on Haggerty Radio Le Mans starts uh, a week oh. today with the exclusive live coverage of the test day extended by a full hour this year, which goes a bit later in the European time. That's good news uh, for those of you uh, here in the United States. Uh, definite move 
by Aaron Tealitz as he covered to the inside. That would have been fine if he'd done it after the stripe, but he was about two or three cars lengths before the stripe. And then, ironically, he moved back to the normal racing line to get his, uh, from all the way from the left-hand side of the circuit to get the uh, correct run through turn one, being a, a right-handed corner, of course. Uh, and if you want to keep up with Le Mans, our coverage, as I say, starts a week today. Go to RadioLeMond.com uh, and our schedule for RS1 will be on the bottom of the page. It's auto-converts to your uh, time zone. Lots of special features looking at the history of Le Mans uh, and also all of the sessions covered live, free and without blocks. No other broadcaster can give you that. Haggerty Radio Le Mans uh, from the 15th of this month. So, 15, check that, uh, 10 minutes gone. I always think 2 hours 45, 2 hours 40 we started with. We're just under 2 hours and 30 minutes to go. And at the front uh, of the GT Daytona field now, dangerous thing to do, Jeremy Shaw, leaving Turner Motorsport at the lead of any pack of cars, particularly the GT Daytonas. And that's where Robbie Foley is at the moment with a full two seconds on Trent Hinman in the blue number 16 Porsche for Wright Motorsports. That's exactly right. Uh, this uh, team has already won twice this season, and uh, Bill Arbery looking for win number 65 in top line American sports car racing. But uh, Robbie Foley off for taking advantage of that penalty for Aaron Tielitz to stretch away just a little bit, but a four car train behind him. Uh, Trent Hinman in second position. He got jumped by Foley at the start, then Robichaud high stand, and behind Richard high stand is uh, Rowan DeAndres as well. So they're all in a nice little train there. Just moving back to the front of the field. That start was really rather interesting, wasn't it? Kevin Magnussen was challenging for third place as he went around turn three. And I was struck at turn three by the fact that Oliver Jarvis gave him plenty of room on the outside of that corner. He could have squeezed him off the racetrack, didn't. But uh, later on in that lap, uh, Kevin Magnussen was trying to make a more aggressive move. He ended up crossing at the back of the pack now. That's a dear one car in deep guy right now. Got an awful lot of work to do. Holly Pla was a big jump out and start up a couple of positions, and the uh, top four or five cars are pretty much equally spaced a second and a half or so apart. It's Jeremy Shaw who's with me, John Hynoff in the Hagney Global Broadcast Centre. Shea Adam is keeping uh, the an eye on the pit and paddock as the leaders now are in traffic. Wheel and engineering driver Philippe Manazza down at turn number five, carving his way through the GT Daytona traffic and going by the car barn by Peregrine Racing Audi as he fights his way through. And, uh, that was Richard Highstand that he was just going by there as he heads through. Yeah, it was. That's the right motorsport portion that he goes by now through Hurry Downs and towards turn number eight. And this is where you've got to have a bit of patience, Jeremy. They're still all, well, getting on for two and a half hours here. It'll be frustrating, I'm sure, for Ricky Taylor to see Felipe Naza and that bright red car getting a little bit smaller ahead of him. But he's got to pick and choose when to go by these GTDs. They are not obliged to pull out the win. They are having their own race. Indeed, in the driver briefing notes, it tells the... Uh, lower class cars, they're a, a wee bit slower. Hold your racing line. Let the fast boys get uh, find their own way around you. Indeed so. And here we are, just uh, seven laps into the race, and already pretty much all of the GTD cars have been lapped by the overall race leader. There's going to be a lot of, uh, of lappery going on during this two hours and 40 minute race, and that is very, very demanding on the drivers mentally, let alone physically. The sun coming out for one of the first times on the weekend. So, uh, it's just not the nice conditions sure. right now. But look, it's it's uh, it's yeah. You know, the, the track traffic is going to be a big issue here. Uh, there's uh, you know, if you can catch somebody going into the kink, that's a one groove racetrack through there. The carousel is difficult to make past as well. You can go around the outside as a prototype car, but uh, again, the drivers are told to keep their racing lines. And for most people, that's an outside line at the carousel as well. So it's going to be an issue all the way through this race, and drivers got to keep their wits about them. Felipe Nasser is negotiating that track it very very nicely. In his last couple of laps, he pulled out all of a sudden three seconds over Ricky Taylor in second position. And Oliver Jarvis just a little bit less than that behind in third. And under pressure now from Oli Clark, who's uh, beginning to uh, turn up the wick a bit. Yeah, not a, not a great weekend for Oli earlier on. Didn't seem to be dialed into the car or the track, which is uh, unusual for Oli, but he got a very good start. Who were the other winners 
and lose as well. He made up a few positions and sits in sit fifth, right, fourth position, excuse me, for my Shank Racing uh, in the number 60 Acura DPI. That's the uh, pink and black car, Sirius XM branding. And thanks to Sirius XM, we're on XM202 across uh, North America for all IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship races. Uh, no. Uh, no interruptions to that. However, going the other way was the uh, was the, the Goldberg car, Shea, uh, who's gone from uh, first to last on the first lap. He did. Now Dan Goldberg is actually back up into sixth position in the LMP3 category. But a new car leading the way, Andretti Autosport, with Jared Andretti behind the wheel, just went purple his last lap around and has nearly a two second gap over Gar Robinson, championship leader. Oliver Askew has been stupid fast in that car all weekend. The 36, when the young Floridian gets behind the wheel, we know it's going to be quick, but Jarrett right now doing exactly what he needs to do. And what a performance from that crew in only, what, their fifth IMSA WeatherTech race. A bit of a difference in tyre strategies uh, for GT Daytona against the rest of the classes. There are specific rules about what tyres you can start the races on, but GTD, GT and Daytona here, we're in a slightly different position because of when they qualified for position and the weather conditions at the time on Saturday. The position qualification for GTD took place on a very dry racetrack at the beginning, so people had slick tires on, meaning that their starting tires are their qualifying tires. By the halfway point of the session, it was raining enough that every single other one of the classes went out on wets, meaning right now, every one of the other classes except GTD started on new slick Michelins as the 42 of Don Yunt has a brief off-track excursion to turn 14, manages to recover. So right now, advantage goes to every category except for GTD. They're gonna run out of tires first. Yeah, so everybody else was allowed to put some of their allocation of brand new tires on. Safety, obviously, you would not uh, start the cars on wet weather tires. Now, Don Yount, as uh, Shea said, just trying, actually, to get out of the way of the Aero Motorsport LMP2 car at Turn 14. Put himself a little bit too far to the left, drop these left-hand side Michelins onto that wet grass. And there we are again, our Porsche keys to the race. Stay off the grass, there's no grip out there today. John Donyan managed to keep momentum going through the gravel bed on driver's left to turn 14, the final right-hander leading up the hill, and he has lived to find another day. Drops down to 14th and last. Still have not seen, by the way, the GRT Grasser Racing Lamborghini. That car uh, still in the pits. Uh, it was, uh, remember, it was having some remedial work to the front end of that car. We think that might have been a braking issue uh, on that car. We'll get confirmation from Shea in a wee moment's time. So in GT Daytona, Turner by now 3.3 seconds from Trent Hindman and the Wright Motorsports number 16, the light blue and black Porsche 911. A similar car, but this time the number nine in the plaid colours, the red and uh, black colours of Faf Motorsport. They're about uh, three quarters of a second further back. And the top six made up by the Carbon Audi R8. Uh, and uh, then the Heart of Racing Aston and the Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini. Bit of a push there for the number 30. Uh, and that got turned around coming into turn number 14. And that was by the, uh, the 38, the bright red uh, number 38. So two of the uh, prototype cars there having real issues coming together. So that was the Junior 3 racing car. Uh, and uh, also the 38 involved there. They were battling for position was Dan Goldberg in the performance tech car. And the Junior 3 car, uh, first time in the big show, Jeremy. We have seen them in IMSA uh, prototype challenge, but that car is not back up to speed yet. No, and that's, uh, that's a shame, isn't it? Uh, great to see that team uh, stepping up from the IMSA prototype challenge. Billy, Grabin, Billy Glavin's crew there, based in Mooresville, North, North Carolina. He's got damage, uh, Jeremy. Super looking, yeah, super-looking organisation. They're very, very tidy indeed. Very uh, professional-looking team. Uh, but it's going to be a, a short day, I think, for them here, making its debut in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Terry also behind the wheel of that car, and there was a coming together, that incident involving 
the Junior 3 Racing number 30 uh, and the number 38 uh, of Dan Goldberg. And Performance Tech Motorsport being looked at in race control as into the pit lane early for the 0-1, the crayon-coloured Cadillac as it comes in with Kevin Magnussen. This is an early stop, 20 minutes in. I don't see uh, any... Uh, any fouls for this car that it should be in. In fact, it is going to its pit stall. Shea Adam, our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter, is watching. Minimal drive time has been met, so if they did want to take Kevin out of the car and put Renger in, they could, but no, just a new sit, a set of slick Michelin tires going on to this Cadillac, this slate colored one, a bit sloppy on the right front tire change, have to say. Bit of trouble getting the wheel gun actually placed as the 30 car continues to creep around the, the track, perhaps this 0-1 crew trying to get ahead of a potential caution beating the rest of the competition on that. Well, they've got their pit stop done, and it was Kevin Magnussen who stayed behind the wheel of the car. Left-hand side tyres only, I, I think, there, Shea, and uh, that car, Jeremy, did go off, remember, at turn six in the early running and took to the grass. Uh, still one or two bits of the countryside hanging on the front splitter there for the 0-1 for the car. Indeed, and as a result of that, he was at the back of the trailer. He was just having a hard time finding way past Tristan Vautier. I'm sure the team felt that Magnussen and he himself felt he was quicker than Vautier, but he was kind of trapped there. And I think they're probably pulling the same sort of strategies we saw the number 31 car pull. It was last time out, wasn't it, at, uh, at, um, at Watkins Glen. The number 31 car came in early for its first stint. It could get to the end of the race here from... I guess it's what three more pit stops uh, so the, you know, if I, it's green all the way there's they still will be on a uh, different but similar different strategy but same number of pit stops before the end of the race so just get ah. try and get out in clean air and uh, when the number five car and hopefully it's the one ones before that as well come in to make their stops magnitude will be able to uh, go fast enough to be able to uh, leapfrog them. But right, everybody else is coming into the pits now because they're expecting a four-course caution because the number 30 junior uh, three car is stranded at the side of the track. Also, Kevin Magnussen in avoiding the two spinning LMP2 cars that we were talking about uh, earlier on did go off the track again. And there was a little bit of contact on the right side. So I wonder if they were just having a look at that uh, as well. Shea Adam watching the pit stops. My phone lit up as a slew of PR people were texting to say, we're coming in, we're coming in, fuel the tires, so it's just going to be a splash. And the four Corvette was the first one of those cars to get the splash done. Nick Tandy has been trying to find a way around Jordan Taylor. Jordan actually did a video on social media a while back about how flashing the headlights doesn't really do anything to the driver in front. We'll see if that's true when it's Nick Tandy who was flashing the lights behind. In terms of prototype, everybody came down the pit lane. Nasser, Taylor, Jarvis, Cameron, and Vautier all taking on fuel and tires, no driver changes there. In the GTD category, we've got Trent Hinman, Zach Robichon, and Madison Snow in with the two Porsches and the Lamborghini, respectively. Fuel and tires there. The full course caution is out. This is a blinder played by some of these teams getting a pit stop and extending their stint length. If your first driver is as good as your second or near enough to it, you might as well bring them in, splash them, and elongate the initial stint because 45 minutes is the minimum amount of time for the silver or bronze driver in the GTD LMP3 and LMP2 categories. And right now we've got three cars in doing the service. It was a great stop by FAF, an even better stop by Wright and just waiting on fuel for Paul Miller Racing. Also into the pit lane, worth noting, we have the 14 Lexus Aaron Tielitz managed to do a stop in and out with splash of fuel and new tires. And from LMP2, only one car came down the pit lane. Keep in mind what I just mentioned with the drive time. White Merriman came in for a splash and new tires. All it's going to mean is when the LMP2 window comes open for the driver change, they're going to have to spend less time on the lane putting fuel in the car because Ryan Dial, who goes in after White Merriman, will have pretty new tires to go out there and battle. I think I uh, made those two cars that came together, LMP2s. They were, of course, LMP3s. And uh, from what I'm sure uh, is also being seen in race control, if Dan Gulp... Uh, Goldberg gets it away with that. I'll be very, very surprised because he did run up the back uh, of uh, Terry Olsen and give him a little helping hand just beyond where the bridge used to be, where the tunnel is right now. So race control, Jeremy, giving everybody a chance to see that car before throwing the full course yellow. The pits are now closed, of course, 
uh, as that car needs to be uh, recovered from just beyond the Sargento bridge out of turn three uh, down towards turn four. Yeah, and uh, you know, hats off to those uh, teams that uh, were able to re react quick enough to get their cars onto pit lane. I think that should help them as the uh, the race progresses. As uh, you said, there just uh, just the one of the four LMP2 cars took advantage of that. That was the number 18 car for Dwight Merriman. Too early to meet the minimum drive time requirement, so no driver change there. Uh, he had been. He got himself up into second place at Dwight Merriman at the start. was running some pretty good laps. Uh, uh, having lost a fair bit of ground to, to Ben Keating early on, he then stabilised that gap. It was running very, very nicely indeed. Finally, though, just as that incident, we, we saw a car off the road at turn 14 a little while ago. I forget which one it was now. Uh, but uh, just the at, Audi, around uh, about that same... Big one. It was the uh, NTE Sport Audi, Don Yount. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it was, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, he, just before that, or at around about that same time, the number 11 car for Steve Collis did get past White Merriman, and he was quite rapidly closing the gap towards Ben Keating. That's all now, of course, a moot point because uh, they're all going to be um, under caution right now. Jeremy Shaw with me, John Hindorf, in the Hagney Global Broadcast Centre. Wow, what an opening! Uh, less than fewer than 30 minutes have been uh, ticked through. And uh, we've already had plenty of passing. Full course caution as well with the Junior 3 LMP3 car being uh, recovered with a flat toe. So it's not that broken. I'm oh, not broken, it's broken and they've lost some laps. But uh, it uh, is still being able to be towed back by one of our safety vehicles. Good opportunity to say thank you very much to all of our volunteer flag marshals recovery, medical and other volunteers over in the UK. We had a, a nasty incident at Brands Hatch last weekend, which cost the lives of a life of one of our marshals, as we call them, the Orange Army, because of the clothing, the colour of the clothing that they wear. And Robert Rob Foot, uh, sadly losing his life at Brands. And also from that side of things, pay tribute to a good friend of us here, at Radio Shore Limited and a personal friend as well to the responsible adult Eve and myself, Bernard Cotterell, who lost what has been a very long battle with leukaemia uh, earlier in the weekend, came up through marshalling and uh, ended up as a FIA steward, also part of the BRSCC, ran the uh, British GT race control for quite a long time he never wanted to be on the end of one of Bernard's hard stairs but he was scrupulously fair and a brilliantly dry wit and just an all-round nice bloke the the uh, term gentleman could not have been uh, better applied to Bernard he's had a, a very positive impact on a lot of people's lives in, including including mine uh, was proud to call him a friend and Jeremy will be a big miss in the uh, the UK and beyond in the motorsport community we of course offer our condolences uh, to the family uh, his immediate family but also the broader motorsport family who will be uh, mourning a, a good friend uh, and a, a super operator as well Bernard uh, I, I have so many stories that I'm sure we'll, we'll get trotted out at another time but I know you you knew him from your time in the UK as well yeah, and uh, you know, going back uh, you know, much m many years later, uh, just uh, just one of those guys you feel comfortable around. He's, he's just exactly. an all, he was indeed an all round good guy. Did a, a lot of good things for this sport. Another super enthusiast, of course, as well. And yeah, he'll be very very sadly missed. That was uh, that was really really bad news to hear that. Uh, there brilliantly today at the second British GT race, which was at Snetterton uh, in the east of of England. Um, they had a minute silence and then, as they described it, an afternoon of noise for Bernard. I think he would have approved of that, Jeremy, wouldn't he? Yeah, he certainly would. Absolutely right. Another name for our uh, Haggerty Radio Le Mans Roll of Honour, which uh, even though we were at Le Mans in September last year uh, and therefore we haven't even had a full year, is distressingly long with uh, people who were around for the last Le Mans and will not be 
for this Le Mans in a couple of weeks time uh, last few of the pit stoppers and share one or two people taking the opportunity to top off here at uh, Rhodes America the ones who were at the back anyway yeah, exactly. The 60, Meyershank Racing Acura, and the 01 Cadillac, both back down the pit lane for a quick splash of fuel. It was much quicker for Dane Cameron than it was for Kevin Magnuson. Uh, the LMP2 leader has come in, Ben Keating. Keep in mind, we are 16 minutes short of minimum drive time. I was not expecting to see our LMP2 field come back down the pit lane. Everybody except for Stephen Thomas. It is a splash only for Dwight Merriman. Era Motorsport had let me know that, which means that the driver change when they hand over to Ryan Dial will need to be a little bit less graceful, perhaps, uh, with the, them having a bit less time. John Ferrano brought the eight in for Tower Motorsport. They did fuel and tires on that stop as well, a minute and five seconds in the pit lane. So that's definitely more work than just a splash. I think they gave Ben new tires as well. He was on the pit lane for a minute and 11 seconds. So good job by PR1 Matheson making their Le Mans debut next week. In the LMP3 category, our leader stayed out. Gar Robinson came in. Uh, John Bennett came in. Augie Pabst came in, Jim Cox all into the pit lane for service. It looks like fuel and tires for all of them as well. Dame Goldberg is still in the pit lane for the Performance Tech number 38 machine. A bit more service going on with that car. Remember, it was involved in a spin earlier on and the contact with the 30 that ultimately resulted in this full course yellow. So that was the prototype pit open. Uh, next time around the look for the GT. It is a team sport here. Well keeping our eye on the race control channel at least here will be in as part of our duties as VP Racing Field Pit Paddock uh, reporter uh, just to make sure that nobody transgressed GTs in next time around just a, a, a quick note these guys are good almost as good as my pit crew last weekend at Silverstone Classic thanks to Richard from RW Racing and to Georgia Biscuit who uh, managed to keep me until Bechtel Scheimer on the Silverstone racing circuit. I said I'd give them a, a mention this weekend. They worked very hard and they had to put up with me uh, and the performance disadvantage of me in their Chevron B8 that they were running for us. Now, Wave Around will start in a moment or two's time. GTs can peel into the pit lane. Uh, in a moment or two as well we're coming down to two hours and eight minutes the cleanup is complete so this is just the procedure of giving everybody a fair crack of the pit lane often get asked and i'm sure it'll come up in michelin post race tech why do these cautions take so long when the track is clear well we've closed the pits and then opened them but also if this was all one class, it would be a lot easier. We could just get back to racing. The problem is that if you're in one of the classes that isn't the top class and the leader's gone past you but hasn't yet passed your class leader, you can easily lose a lap and it completely ruins your race. And in a two-hour, 40-minute race, you're not getting that back. It's always a problem with multiple class racing. So all of the things that are happening now uh, in place by IMSA to try and mitigate the effect of a full course caution coming out at an inopportune moment uh, for the minor classes. GTs are in the pit lane, shit. Looks like plenty are taking service. Busy, busy, busy pit lane. Fuel and tires for the Trinity Motorsport BMW. Rob Foley staying aboard. Fuel and tires for the heart of racing. Aston Martin. Splash of fuel for Faf, Paul Miller, and Wright Motorsports. All three of those cars came in before the yellow, so they are just topping off their fuel tanks to try and extend this stint a little bit. Championship leader, number three Corvette is in. This is Antonio Garcia installing himself behind the wheel of this Corvette. Fuel and tires for the Corvette as well. I guess uh, Jordan didn't like Nick flashing his lights out when they were out of there. Just give me a bit of grief, Jordan. Uh, for the number 79 Porsche, the WeatherTech racing machine, Cooper McNeil, hometown hero, is done with his stint, meaning that it is time for Australian ace Matty Campbell to go out. And he has been really fast so far this weekend. He set the fastest time in warm-up, as a matter of fact, for the GT class. So let's see what Matt can do for the remainder of this one. Uh, also in from the GTD standings, we had Richard Highstand in the 39 Carbon Audi, Till Bechtelsheimer in the 66 Gradient Racing Acura, Rob Ferriel in the Team Hardpoint Porsche, and Shane Lewis in the Gilbert Cawthorf Mercedes. So it was very busy down there. At IMSA Radio, if you'd like to uh, get in touch with us. Hello to Alex Brundle. 
He was very kind to me at that Silverstone Classic meeting. I wasn't sure it was you in the car when you were coming round, but uh, I didn't really mean to block you coming through Cops, but I was determined I wasn't going to go a lap down, Alex. You could have made that a lot harder uh, than it was. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, and a great win in the Lola T70 in very wet conditions for Alex in the race in which I was driving around. I won't say I was racing. I never say I'm a racing driver. I say sometimes I get to drive race cars. Uh, Alex proving his worth in uh, a variety of classic machinery across the weekend. And if you get a chance to see some, some of Alex, uh, Alex Brunzel's um, social media channels, the onboard in the Jaguar was just extraordinary how much he was putting into uh, into the steering of that to pedal that car quickly. Uh, and happy birthday, slightly belated, Alex, as well, uh, for, uh, I think, a couple of days ago. Hope to see you trackside uh, sometime soon. We miss you in the commentary box, Alex, but we're much happier when you're in a racing car because that is clearly your dear job. Alex tuned in and watching on imsaradio.com. Hit the live video button if you're outside the US. Here in the US, of course, Brian Till will be taking you through all the action on NBCSN from 8 o'clock Eastern. That uh, programme on slight tape delay uh, later on this evening because of uh, how much sport is on NBCSN today. And good to see our colleague Brian Till leading that broadcast. What a start this race, says Kev Hamilton. Frantic half hour of pure joy. Wow, still two hours and ten minutes to go. Yeah, just a little less than that now. Uh, and uh, also to Dave Alcock, who's listening in. And Chris Humphreys, one of our Orange Army as well. Hello, Chris. Thanks for all your hard work, trackside as well. Thanks for your support of IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. Right, before we go back to green, probably a good idea with all the pit stops now happening, or, or have happened, let's have a look at the rundown. It'll be Philippe Naza for Wheel and Engineering, who started from pole position in the 31 red and white Cadillac, who will be behind the safety car until that pulls away, and therefore he will see the green flag first from Ricky Taylor in the black and blue Acura number 10. Then the white, red and blue Mazda, 55 of Oli Jarvis. All of these are the starting drivers. Mustang sampling JDC Miller car. That's the dark grey number five. Dean Cameron for Mayer Shank Racing in the black and purple car in fifth position. Then the LMP2 leader, Stephen Thomas for Win Autosport in the number 11. Then the LMP3 leader, it's Jared Andretti for Andretti Autosport in the 36. As far as the other classes are concerned, Nick Tandy has managed to get ahead of the three car, the other Corvette, which now has got Antonio Garcia on board, so they did a driver change then in that three car. Matt Campbell will be in third in GT Le Mans, and in GT Daytona, it's Vassa Sullivan back at the front of that field. Let me just uh, refresh that to make sure that, I've, that we've got that right. Is that right, Shea? Yes, it is. Cars that haven't been on the pit lane at all so far in this race. Frank Montecalvo, Jeff Kingsley, John Potter, and Don Ute. All four of those drivers waiting for minimum time to elapse so they can switch off to their faster counterparts. So Trent Hindman, when they go in for right motorsports in the 16, that's the teal, blue, and black Porsche 911, he will actually be leading the race. He's been down pit lane twice already, but will sit fifth in the GT Daytona Q, if that makes uh, any sense. Uh, also, having been down the pit lane twice, Zachary Robichon for FAF Motorsports. We saw those two guys coming in together and Madison Snow for Paul Miller Racing. So they, Jeremy, have brim-filled their, uh, their fuel tanks uh, and therefore are extending their fuel window a bit further into the race, having come down the pit lane twice. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, you know, why not? Nothing, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained by that and uh, they, as you say they can extend it maybe you know, another lap or potentially two and that could be significant for exactly the reason we we're talking about earlier on but they are now back on the same strategy uh, as everybody else unfortunately they're still at the back of the pack so that uh, ploy coming in on lap 10 didn't really work for them so waiting for the word from race control as we tick down towards still two hours to go so there's plenty of racing still left in this one 
waiting for the green flag. It's very much to me as though Felipe Nasser has thought that it's time to go, and we do have the green flag. He set off quite early there from before turn 14, gave himself plenty of room so he didn't overtake the safety car, the Corvette C8, into the pit lane. That was a smart move by Nasser, and it's an exemplary restart as he's pulled out a couple of three cars lengths through turn one, heading down the hill to turn three, all the way to the left-hand side, almost dropping the Michelin tyres into the dirt there, but not quite for turning in, right, getting on the throttle as hard as possible because it's flat out now, all the way through the little right-handed kink at turn four, and then down the hill to turn five. Oli Jarvis in third position, weaving left and right, trying to get some heat into the Michelin tyres on his DPI, the Mazda, in the autumn of its IMSA competition. Years now, no renewal of the programme after this year. Been a great addition to the championship, and my goodness, Mazda have done well here in the past. And that uh, two-litre four-cylinder engine has done well here in the past in different guises as well through the almost never ending right hander at the carousel as we've had another spin that's the era motorsport prototype again has gone around it's quite merriman who restarted that car just a moment or two ago in fourth in lmp2 turn five half spin but he's got going again my goodness jeremy even though we've had some interruptions here you cannot fail particularly if you're trackside on the rundown from the kink to Canada corner. Cannot fail to be impressed with these DPIs. Proper racing cars and proper racing speeds here at Road America. And a great track to watch them as well. Oh, yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, that uh, that section between just after the kink and Canada corner now on the, uh, on the inside of the racetrack on the dry on driver's right. It's a spectacular place to watch. Uh, I've said it before, it's not for the faint of heart because the cars are flying along there and it's not exactly a, a massive barrier in the way between uh, you, yourself as a spectator and a race car either. Uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's certainly a great place to go watch and uh, and you really get do get a proper feeling of speed down there. You know, the average speed, uh, the, the qualifying lap record here, the average speed is 134 miles an hour out here, which is, which is not hanging around, is it? Not at all. Shea Adam, let's uh, check in, watching the race control channel. Uh, VP Racing Fuel Pit Paddock report. A few things for them to have a look at, Shea. What can you tell us? Uh, the incident involving cars 38 and 30, the performance tech machine and the uh, junior three racing car that ultimately came to a stop and caused that yellow. It was reviewed by race control. No further action deemed necessary. OK, so... We race on. Side by side action in GT Daytona. Baff Porsche. It's got one of the Lexus right alongside. That's the battle for first and second in GT Daytona. Heading down towards turn five. Up to turn six. Still side by side. And the Porsche just about gets through. Was on the inside, the left hand side of the track there. And Frank Montecalvo has had to give up first position there to Zachary Robichon. And Jeremy. That was really respectful racing, very hard, but those two drivers side by side through some fast and difficult corners there, but an absolute textbook illustration of giving somebody racing room. He, he did so, and Zach Rubishaw, he's absolutely flying here since the restart. He took took the green flag in the uh, sixth position in the class, now up to... Uh, to... Second, is he, is he's in the lead now. The that lead was for the lead. He's in yeah. the lead now. Exactly right. Was getting past Frankie. So he's absolutely flying there. This is a car that won here a, a couple of years ago. Uh, Maddie Campbell was on, alongside Zach Rubichon on that occasion. But this is certainly a track that Zach, among many others, regarded as one of their favourite race tracks of, of anywhere. And he's showing why this afternoon. Frank Monte Calvo uh, adding. And another member of the family. Uh, their first child for Paige and uh, Frankie. New addition arriving on Thursday. As uh, Frankie was heading off to the racetrack. Oh, good. <laughs> Bet that went down well. Wish that. Uh, no? 
He stayed at home on Friday and he came to the track yesterday. Okay, He's very a good, good. Boy. good lad. Yeah, very smart. Very smart indeed. Very smart indeed. We wish them uh, all the best with uh, the new addition. Page, hope you're well. So coming down to an hour and 55 still to go and the field just trying to get back into a rhythm again after that safety car. Turn five has been one of the biggest passing places here. Court Autosport and John Bennett just losing third position in LMP3 there to the performance tech number 38. Dan Goldberg cleared of any instant responsibility and immediately makes an overtaking manoeuvre, celebrating his ability to race on there at the front of the LMP3 field and in ninth position overall, Jared Andretti for Andretti Autosport in the distinctive black, white and uh, green striped number 36 at Ligier, Jeremy. It's a good run for them again and they're making a really good fist of being in the IMSA WeatherTech Sport Car Championship. Yeah, and Jared Andretti, he's, he's the only one of the LMP3 cars not to have made a pit stop so far in this contest, so it won't be long before we see that number 36 car onto the pit lane, so it's going to put them off sequence with everybody else, but what it is going to give them the opportunity to do, and Matt will be in this time around, is for him to hand over to Oliver Askew to go the remainder of the distance, because the 45 minutes minimum time has now been achieved, and our 54, 55 uh, almost remaining in this motor race. Tell you who that uh, that safety car really helped. And Kev Hammond rightly points this out. It was the number 14 Lexus who had that early drive through. We did see it. All they need is a safety car. You wouldn't push it past them, Jeremy, to get a really good result after this. Aaron Teal, it's already back up to fourth position in class. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, you know, the car's been fast uh, all weekend long. Uh, strangely, uh, Jack Hawks have really struggled yesterday in the wet in qualifying. Aaron Tillis put the car on pole position for the race, and then that session, the qualifying session to determine the, the grid positions for today, was followed by the points qualifying session, and the order, and that was totally different. And Jack Hawks was here in a couple of offs and just wasn't clearly wasn't comfortable at all but uh, now conditions are dry that even the sun is shining and Aaron T is moving his way forward again uh, up into the tail now of uh, of well pretty close by his teammate and he has set I believe yes on that last lap the fastest lap of the race in GTD that's Aaron T that's a 209.0 yeah he's right behind uh, right motorsports Porsche Oops. Trent Hindman was yeah, they're coming side by side yeah. to the top of the hill. Remember that uh, Trent is the first of the GTD cars. Uh, sorry, now the second of the GTD cars to stop. Frank Monty Calvo still not being down the pit lane in that number 12 car, so he's going long into the race. Uh, we've been running nearly 55 0 minutes now, but with some safety cars. So. Uh, he will be coming to the end of his fuel run uh, in that number 14 car, in that number 12 car, excuse me, that sits in second position. But they've rolled the dice on that and split the strategy. Didn't really have much choice, Jeremy, as far as the, the Paul City number 14 Lexus was concerned. After that, that drive-through, they've made the best of it. They've actually been down the pit lane three times, once for the drive-through and then uh, just before the safety car uh, and then at the safety car when the pits were, were open. Uh, they've chosen the opposite direction with the, the other car, with Frank Monte Calvo in it. Yes. Um, and, you know, why not uh, split, split the strategies? Gives you two, two different opportunities to uh, shine at the end of the race. I don't know how this one's going to play out. Let's hope for a long stretch of green flag racing so we can start to see the relative performance of of these cars as usual the gt daytona battle is mighty and zachary robichon leads for faf motorsport tealitz still to stop in second and in behind now what is the Cole miller racing car doing in there that car was in fifth the last time that I looked. Uh, but, right, OK. Uh, about to try and take fourth position. Yes, that uh, makes sense. Down the outside at turn five on the 
Number 12 for Frank Montecalvo has dropped back a little bit, still waiting for his first pit stop. So it's Robichon from Taylitz, from Hendman, from Frank Montecalvo, from Madison Snow. That's your top five in in GTD. And as of course, as I read that, Madison does go through and also looks very much to me uh, as if the Turner Motorsport car, Robbie Foley, has gone through as well. Yes, it has. That was the car that was leading convincingly, Jeremy, before we had those safety car periods. Robbie Foley had taken the opportunity to drive away. He's going to have to do a little more work now and pass a few cars to get back to the leading class. Yeah, so uh, this is going to be a battle that's going to continue all the way through this race. We've seen how closely matched these, uh, these cars are, all these different manufacturers involved. It's just tremendous racing in GT Daytona, and it's, it's certainly interesting to see these different strategies playing out. Second, Rubichon. Uh, presumably taking advantage of fresh uh, tyres because of all the rain we've had through the weekend. They've got plenty of tyres uh, to, to use amongst uh, from their allocation, so why not put on fresh tyres every time you possibly can? And I think uh, Zachary Rubichon taking advantage of that in the lead of the class. I mean, taking the restart in the fifth position with a car that we know is always fast around here at Red America. So Jeremy Shaw and John Heindorf in the Hanky Global Broadcast Centre. If you want to ask us a question, you've got uh, you've spotted something on the other track side of Firth Field at Inter Radio Place. 87.9 FM and 454 is our scanner frequency at the track as well. Or you can get us on RS2, IMSA Radio via IMSAradio.com. XM202 as well at this weekend. All of our races on at least one serious XM channel for IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Let's take some updates from our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock Report in Shea Adam with just under an hour and 50 minutes to go. Ten minutes before the hour is elapsed. Shea, what's the situation? Uh, we've got driver changes up and down the pit lane. Uh, first off, Frankie Montecalvo, after losing two spots on that lap, has come onto the pit lane and handed over to Zach Veach, who's going out and racing at Road America for the first time in a car with a roof on it. He's raced here four times before in the IndyCar Championship, but sports cars is new, and they're having trouble on the driver change, actually. The tires and fuel were done a long time ago. Didn't look like they got the window net up on that car, but I will leave it to the IMSA officials for the better judgment of that, but a very slow driver change dropped in that car way down the field. We've also had the number 88 team hardpoint EBM Porsche on the pit lane. Rob Ferriel brought it in. Cat Leg will be taking it back out. And also from GTD, Compass Racing. It now is Super Mario behind the wheel of that Acura. And uh, Andy Lally behind the wheel of the 44 Magnus Racing Acura. Two pit stops that we saw in LMP2 that are relevant. The 11 now has Tristan Nunez. And the 8, the Tower Motorsport car, Gabby Aubrey. Oh, shit. Big incident down just beyond the kink. And it's the car barn Audi that's gone around. Huge. Uh, dust cloud there, brilliant piece of avoidance by everyone behind him. What I can't say is uh, whether he jumped, whether he was pushed or whether he just went onto the grass. But I think uh, Richard Highstand has avoided any major damage. I'm looking both sides of the car barn Audi, that grey and green machine going round the right hander at Canada Corner. The full course yellow came out really has to quickly at that point because it is such a quick corner. Richard's eyes wide open with him struggling through turn 14, but he's got the car in the right direction. This will be a quick yellow in every sense of the word because it's fewer than 15 minutes to uh, since the last uh, caution and I'm not sure the pits will even open here. He, yeah, lot, he was trying to stay out the way of one of the prototypes coming through, and that's uh, one and a half rotations, and just pulls it up on the grass. Uh, the My Shank racing car had just gone through, and just went a little bit wide. The zero one one Cadillac was in close attendance, but there was no touch. May have just had a little aero wash from the two prototypes ahead of him. It was the Mustang sampling car and the, oh, well, mm, now, did the zero one one stick a nose in where it didn't need to be, which uh, caught uh, Richard Highstand out. He's very lucky, Jeremy, that he didn't make contact with anything hard there. He's shaking his head now. 
I, I think he's a bit disappointed. He's talking on the radio, possibly a bit disappointed that uh, Kevin Magnussen it still is, isn't it, behind the wheel of that Cadillac, stuck his nose in at the kink. Now, you said earlier on, that is a one-groove part of the racetrack. He's up alongside somebody now and giving them the real stink eye. Yeah, absolutely. He's not happy at all, is he, with, uh, with that'll be Magnussen that's alongside him. I'm guaranteeing you that. Yeah, I think so. And uh, you're right, yeah, there's a little bit of uh, sports car inexperience there, I think, showing for Kevin Magnussen because uh, you know you just got to be patient here that is that all cars are fully committed once they're turning in to the kink and clearly when magnuson tried to get alongside him the number 39 uh, audi gtd car was clearly committed to the corner that says you just got to back right out of it and let the gt car go gtd car go yes you're going to lose a fair bit of ground particularly you're going to hit the brakes going into the kink but you'll make it up again uh, sure as sure as anything uh, within a lap or two so yeah i think they yeah, they were jolly lucky there i think highstand did a fantastic job jump on the brakes lock everything up keep it as much as he can on the on the uh, on the gray stuff that'll scrub off speed a lot more quickly and uh he'll he'll need a change of tires on that car for sure but other than that he's got away with it i think and that was really really scary and it could have been extremely nasty yeah change of tires and uh Possibly a change of racing underwear as well. That was a huge, huge moment. Just trying to check. Sorry, Jeremy, go ahead. I'll no, just say, but this is bad news, certainly for the uh, the cars that have not yet pitted, uh, which I think there's probably only one, actually. Number 36, Andretti Autosport, Ligier, Jared Andretti, uh, didn't get an opportunity to come into the pits. Number 54 car was a fair bit farther back down the racetrack and was able to duck in the pits uh, when the caution came out, but I, I'm pretty sure number 36 was already past pit entrance, so didn't have an opportunity to do so. Having said that, there's been a half a dozen laps, or you know, two or three laps after the 45-minute window that he did have an opportunity to come into the pit lane, did, did elect, elected not to. So I think that was a strategic miscue there by Andretti Autosport because this is going to be a short yellow. We had not gone 15 minutes since the previous green, so they will not, will not be opening the pits for the uh, for the usual pit stop sequences. So they're going to have to wait until we go back to green before they can bring that number 36 car into the pit lane to hand over to Oliver Askew. And that's unless there's other full course cautions later on, that's going to be a big mountain to climb for the number 36 team. Yeah, very much so. Very much so, Jeremy. Keep an eye on that. So we've got under an hour and, well, just on an hour and 43 minutes still to go. Second full course yellow. Once again, the Corvette safety car is leading around the field. Uh, we had that car out for 16 and a half minutes earlier on. It's already been out for five minutes here. <laughs> Deep breath. Deep breath, Richard. Yeah, that was, it, it was, you know what, there wasn't a touch there, Jeremy, but that was still not uh, not the best place to, for Kevin to be putting his nose in. Uh, those prototypes move a bit of air as well, actually, so you'd have felt that up alongside at that, at that pace. Good reactions from the Heart of Racing Aston, which was one of the next cars along, give, give themselves a little bit of space. Now, Richard's going to be in trouble here because he drove up right the way along the safety car train to get alongside Magnussen and give him a little bit of a look and also a bit of intimidation. I can understand his frustration, but I think, Jeremy, that might be looked on... Um, might attract the ire of race control there. Leave them to, yeah. to look at that sort of stuff. That might be both called to the principal's office at the end of their stints for a meeting without coffee or biscuits, I think. <laughs> yeah, well put. Uh, there's no, no point doing that, taking your, your anger out after the race. There's no point doing it after the race. You're not supposed to be passing any cars under full course caution for obvious reasons. Uh, and clearly he did that. Did he want to make his point uh, via his fist, which is yeah, not, not, the, uh, not the smartest move there. 
trying to see when cars came in uh, whether the pits were closed. Full course Yolo came out at 54 seconds past 32 minutes past the hour. If that makes any sense. Uh, ben Keaty, I think, was already in the pits at that point. Uh, yes, he was. Yeah, uh, that's the 52 LMP2 car. Rob Furriol came in just before that safety car, about a minute, a little less than that, and so did Frank Monte Calvo. So they all got in OK before the pits were closed. Yeah. I was also wondering where the number 11 car was, but that's got the uh, the wave around now. He's trying to catch up the, the back of the field. Out. Yeah, the winner of the sport car. So the, it, that is on the lead lap with everybody else in LMP2. So there will be no pit lane opening and there'll be a class split to put the DPIs back at the front of the field, but that's all. So it will be Felipe Nasser who once again has to bring the cars to the green flag from Ricky Taylor. So the 31 red and white Cadillac from the 10 black and blue Acura, then the mostly white number 55 Mazda with the big blue stripe and the red pinstripes either side. Tristan Fortier has the dark grey and gold number five Cadillac in fourth position then Dan Cameron for the black and purple Acura and then the chalk coloured zero one Cadillac in sixth position that's how they'll restart in GTT it's Porsche from Faf the number nine plaid car from the bright yellow Lexus number 14 which started in pole position and then dropped all the way to the back. Then Trent Hinman from right to the blue and black Porsche. That's your top three. Ahead of Paul Miller Racing's Lamborghini, the red, white and black number one car. We're racing again. And the six prototypes head into turn one. The DPIs then racing again. We'll wait for the rest of the field. But that was another early jump by Philippe Nase. And he's timing this absolutely perfectly, Jeremy. He's got no worries at all about having to defend into turn one or turn three he's taking the optimum line every time without any any obstruction whatsoever having to fight off either Ricky Taylor or Ollie Jarvis good stuff good stuff indeed yeah and uh, you know, Felipe Nasser once again showing his class here he showed it yesterday in uh, very different conditions in qualifying it was wet and he was absolutely masterful and we heard he, when he spoke to Shay Adam this morning uh, he was explaining that on the next lap after he set the pole position lap, he tried to get a bit, bit more speed at turn five, just trying to feel out the conditions. The car had a quick spin down there, but again, no harm, no foul. He didn't cause any red flags or anything like that. So, uh, you yeah, know, he was just absolutely on the limit and he was on the limit again in very co different conditions now and trying to trying to literally make hay while the sun shines here at Road America. Yeah, the great shit. Adam, uh, LMP3 car spinning including i think that the car that was in the lead there yes and oliver askew will come out last of the three cars that pitted due to a much slower stop than either of the riley technology lmp3 machines felipe fraga is in the 74 that's the orange and blue machine and it is now dylan murray's opportunity to drive the wind sponsored number 91. Oh. yeah those cars waiting for the pits to reopen. Chris Humphreys, who as I mentioned earlier on, is a marshal and does do some stewarding uh, as well. This is one thing I like to pass on to drivers, whether in real life or in sim racing, is whatever happens, move on with the race. Let's the stewards of the race control deal with any incident. Whatever wants to, whatever a driver wants to say or do will probably only make things worse nine times out of ten. Sage words, Chris Humphreys. Sage words indeed. Coming down towards uh, 90 minutes. One hour and 30, just under th one hour 37 actually, so just under 100 minutes still to go. And the usual street fight in the streetcar class for GT at Daytona at the moment. Zachary Robichon managed to pull out uh, about a second and a half on the RT. Let's go. Oh, I say that. And maybe it's closed up just a little bit. Trent Hinman looking at the back of Aaron Tealitz there. They're in traffic at the moment and being passed by a number of different categories, including the GTLM, yes. And has been a good restart for FAF Motorsport. Zachary Robichon driving an absolute belter of a race at the moment, Jeremy. 
He is, he is, isn't he? It was a tremendous uh, restart after the previous course from period. He made up five positions in the opening uh, three, two or three laps, and uh, he's certainly taking advantage of that. He's out in front and looking to extend that lead. Um, and uh, for some reason, uh, this this track just suits that team and driver in particular. They, they won here a couple of years ago and would love nothing more than to do the same again. Now, there's a pit stop for the car that was running fourth position in GTD, so it's not the off strategy with uh, everybody else, but uh, can probably make the end of the race with one more pit stop from here. Shea Adam was watching that, and the car in question was the number one, the red, white and black Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini. Shea, what's the story? bit of strategy coming into play once again for Paul Miller Racing and Brian Sellers who did not get to drive at all at Lime Rock Park is now installed behind the wheel of the car. They're putting Brian out into clean air with no traffic around him and going off strategy in terms of when they will need to do their next pit stop. So this car already thinking about the end of the race. Yeah, back timing to the next 95 minutes. Uh, with everything that's been going on, that's not the worst thing to do when you see the traffic jabs of the GTDs with the cars coming through. Not only does it mean you're not making your best pit times, uh, lap times rather, you're probably using a bit more tyre, and of course you're in danger of getting caught up in somebody else's accident, as we've almost seen a couple of times already. Like this strategy, they have full confidence in Brian. Madison's done his job. I presume, Shea, that Madison won't get back in now. Brian will take that to the end. Correct. Good luck trying to get Brian out of that car. <laughs> I, I did see him with this uh, tube of, uh, of super glue before he sat uh, down. It's just, I like the way he has that, you know, just sits on it as soon as he gets in there. And that's him for the rest of the race at that point. <laughs> exactly. And it's in a seat insert too. So ah. they could pry him out if they needed to, but he really don't want to. No, an awful mess. Awful mess in there. So keep an eye on the progress then of the number one Lamborghini from Paul Miller Racing. Here at the track side or further afield, imsa.com has links to the Alcamel timing from there. And you can see what we're seeing in the Hagerty Global Broadcast Centre. And that tells the story as follows in GT Le Mans, which we haven't looked at for a wee while. Where Nick Tandy's pulled out in a couple of seconds now on his teammate Antonio Garcia. So it's the brand new Corvette. That is a new chassis for this weekend. It is going to go to France uh, and become the backup chassis for the Le Mans 24 hours. Uh, Antonio Garcia in the number three car in second. And then just uh, three quarters of a second behind now, Matt Campbell in the WeatherTech Racing Porsche. He'll be into the end as well, trying to keep the two Corvettes honest. Remember, that car is uh, going to Le Mans as well. Matt Campbell uh, will be at Le Mans, but not in that car. Cooper McNeil paired with Lawrence Van Tour and Earl Bamba. Bam Thor reunited, and Shea is going to be telling me we've got to call that Muck, Muck Bam Thor. It's the best thing you can order on the McDonald's menu. Muck Bam Thor. <laughs> Muck Bam Thor. All a bit Grey's Anatomy for me, that one, but very good. Yeah, all right, I'll go, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. In uh, GT Daytona, we've mentioned Faf Motorsport Porsche ahead by about three and a half seconds from Tealitz and Vassar Sullivan in the Lexus number 14. Uh, LMP3, bit of a shake-up since those pit stops. So Colin Brown for Court Autosport, 10th overall in the white and tangerine number 54, is leading handsomely from uh, Rasmus Lind, who has been installed in the Performance Tech number 38. That's the black and red car. About uh, well, quite a, a ways back, actually, about five seconds behind Oggy Paps for Wolver Racing. He's in third position in the 61. In LMP2, Michael Jensen for PR1 Matheson Motorsport, the number 52, seventh overall. Aero Motorsport, despite the uh, one or two little issues early on. Ryan Diel in the blue, number 18 now. Just half a second behind, that's a good scrap. Tristan Nunes, uh, in, oh sorry, Gabby Aubrey, should I say, for Tower, the number eight car in third position, just another two tenths back. It's the top three in class there, covered by under a second in seventh, eighth and ninth overall for LMP2, That's, good scrap. It is a good scrap, isn't it, John? And, and each of those three cars have their, their best laps of the race on that last lap, so, you know, fully up to speed now, three laps after the uh, the restart, and uh, turning, you yeah, know, pretty much identical laps there, those three cars in the lead of LMP2. A little bit of a gap back then to the LMP3 leader, which 
with all the uh, shuffling went on during that round of pits. It's Colin Brown who holds the advantage there. Again, great strategy. They got him in uh, to the uh, pit stops at, the, at, uh, at, at a good time right before this latest caution period. So make that driver change yeah. and get Colin Brown to out to in the lead. He's going to be awfully difficult to catch from there. Well, he's had a couple of new fastest laps in class, but uh, that is just being taken from him uh, by... Now, who did I see that just flash of Tristan Nunes for win Autosport? Uh, so they, uh, uh, sorry, that's a P2 car, wasn't it? Who did I just see flash up there in the LMP3 category? It must have been... Ah, there Dan we are, Murray. Down, still a Murray. I knew I'd seen a purple tie. I just didn't go down far enough for Riley Motorsports, number 91. Sorry, Jeremy, my, my, my eyes weren't deceiving me there. I was just in the wrong part of the timing screen. That was the last time around 2019 takes the best lap in class back from Colin Brown uh, a 2 or 2 5 from him uh, a couple of three laps ago yeah so uh, good speed shown by uh, both of those guys Oliver Askew uh, is right behind he turned his best lap on that last lap as well but he lost nearly a second to uh, Dylan Murray who's ahead of him on the road uh, those two plus Felipe Fraga who's a couple of seconds further up the road also turned his best on that last lap uh, they're the three cars that made their pit stops to driver changes after we went back to green. I've now just made all of the numbers bigger on my timing screen. <laughs> after, the, after that setup change for Hindoff there. Uh, eyes are getting a bit tired after a, a long weekend staring at the screens. Under 90 minutes to go now, wherever you are in the world. RS2, IMSAradio.com, the home of everything IMSA. That's where all of our free archive is as well thank you for joining us around the circuit on 87.9 fm and our scanner frequency 454 thanks to tyler and the team for hooking us up the team at the circuit doing a great job as well and if we say thanks to people we must say a big thank you to all our camera operators and our colleagues at nascar productions both uh, at the track side and in mission control at Charlotte. They've had a, an exceedingly busy weekend already, still managing to give us pictures from all around the track. XM202 as well, if you are suitably equipped in North America. Keep an eye on Kevin Magnussen. He's coming round to put another lap on the Audi number 39. Close encounters of the magnificent kind that put that car into a spin oh. earlier on. And uh, need to keep our eye on that when he comes back around again to Richard Highstand, who was the driver of the car bomb with Perrigan Racing Audi. It's the number 39, the dark grey with green, or the mid grey with green. Highlights on it. Highlights being the operative word. Uh, those two in very close contact, and uh, that rather put Richard uh, into the red in terms of uh, the rev limit for him, not the car. So let's keep an eye on that when they come back around. In the meantime, Aussie Ace, as Shea described him, uh, rather aptly, in fact, Matt Campbell, uh, right in behind Antonio Garcia for Corvette Racing. As they're battling for second and third. And we have pit stops, Shea Adam. I miss Dean Cameron getting into the 60 mile shake racing Acura, but indeed he's been in it for at least this stint. He has come down to the pit lane, full tires and a drinks bottle, I believe it was the message that I was receiving for him. So that should be a quick pit, pit stop. Uh, no, no drinks bottle. The door is staying closed. Uh, there we go. There it is. See, I knew that they were going to be doing it. It was premonition. Um, but they are doing what looks to be a pretty standard stop, four tires and the full tank of VP Racing Fuel. And then Dane Cameron will go back out for another stint. So this is the first of our second real stops for the DPI cars in this race. That car has rejoined and with sunshine and shadows under the car even as it goes back onto the pits. More traffic for the leader dealt with expertly by Felipe Nazar and Dan Cameron. 19 laps for that stint. Um, some six laps of yellow, 43 minutes. Uh, in that car. Oof, says Jeremy. 
no prisoners taken going through the traffic here by NASA, were there? Uh, no, he's uh, he's not hanging around. He's uh, extending his lead again. He's got a couple of seconds in hand now over Ricky Taylor in second position. Uh, the uh, all the DPI cars just stretched out just a little bit. Oliver Jarvis is around about a second behind. So he's uh, you know, but these gaps gaps fluctuate um, constantly as a, as a as a consequence of where they catch lower traffic, as we saw earlier on when Kevin Bankson tried to dive inside the 39 GTD car going through the kink, uh, had to back out. That uh, you know that cost him a fair bit of ground, and that's going to happen at various different parts on this race track. You're going to you're going to lose a second or two uh, at any particular time. But uh, Felipe Nazar, he's uh, got his head down, making some incisive moves through the traffic and uh, trying to eke out that little bit more of a margin. It's now over three seconds for the... Well, no, it was, it was up to four seconds, actually, before the first caution came out. Down to turn number three. What is the collective noun for LMP? Three cars. There's a group of them, at least, as they're heading through the wind's car under pressure sure. at the moment, Jeremy. A lot of Ligiers. A lot of Ligiers, yeah, very good. I like that. Around the outside in uh, turn number five, the tower car trying to go around the wind's machine. So that is a battle for a position, of course. That's Gabby Aubrey in the number eight car. Jensen in the uh, PR1 Matheson Motorsport machine. And down towards the carousel under the Speedfield Bridge. I think Ryan DL's gone past the pair of them and cleared off into the distance. I caught a flash of blue there, Jeremy. Yes, he has. Uh, he's uh, managed to go by them, I think. Uh, on this lap, in that case. Uh, yeah, un unless... I'll have, I'll have another look. I just, it was, I just had that uh, a flash of a blue car whilst we were watching the side-by-side -side action. Um, in fact, if I'd had any sense at all, I would have looked at my tracker, wouldn't I? Yeah, no, in, in, in the middle sector there, uh, all of a sudden, the DL was two seconds quicker than both Jensen Correct. and Aubrey, so uh, something happened on that lap. Yeah, he is ahead of the 52, yeah. definitely. So, right. yeah, it goes across the line now. Uh, and there is DL going through for Aero Motorsport in that blue car. It's quite a distinctive colour, that car. And as I say, I caught a flash of it whilst we were describing the action for you for what is now second place then. And DL not only caught, but now passed and pulled out 2.8 seconds of a lead over Mikkel Jensen in second from P.R. Matheson, the wins car, and the tower car in third. That's number eight. And then it's uh, around about 15 seconds back to Tristan Nunez, who again is looking to put in some decent laps uh, and try and catch the cars. Ahead. He's lapping a couple of seconds quicker than well, on the that cars ahead. Lap, yeah, yeah. yeah. On that, just on that particular lap, because uh, whatever happened, those two cars cost themselves a couple of seconds somewhere. It was turn five or, or turn one. Be the most likely uh, places for that to have happened, but uh, that's why he was uh, so, so much quicker on that particular lap for Tristan Nunez. But Nunez has set the fastest lap of the race so far in that class at a 155.3. So let's pick up some battles around the circuits. Always somebody to pass, not always for position in class. That's what's happened for Tristan Fortier in the dark grey Cadillac number five. Just picking off some of the lap traffic, but he has. Well, there's another incident at the same spot, Jeremy, for Kevin Magnussen going up the inside of, uh, of uh, another prototype. And Magnussen in a carbon copy manoeuvre. Uh, and that was Fortier, and he's put him on the grass. Now, that's twice there now that that's happened. And... Fortier on the grass at high speed, coming out of the right-handed kink, and has come into the pit lane, where Shea Adam is watching him into his, back, into, his, uh, into his pit box. 
hits as well as Ollie Jarvis and Loic Duval taking over the five for Mustang sampling. And it looks like Harry Tinknell is being installed into the Mazda. So two former Audi drivers not allowed out on track at the same time in the form of Duval and uh, Jarvis. They've mixed it up. Uh, but fuel and tires going on for both of the cars just waiting on the fuel for the Mazda. Still doing the tire change for the Cadillac. The Mazda is cleared to leave its box. The Cadillac is off the jacks waiting for the fuel nozzle to come out. I believe the Mazda will get out well ahead of the Cadillac, resuming in the fourth position. We'll have to see where Dane Cameron is on the racetrack, though, because all three of these cars battling for the first step off the podium. Shea Adam with that VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock report. Uh, so that's uh, another driver that will want to be having a word with Kevin Magnussen when he gets back to the pit lane. I uh, have to stress, there's been no contact here, no contact at all. Uh, but that is a very fast part of the racetrack. There's nothing to say that, that you can't do that, Jeremy. But you've got to be absolutely certain that the guy on the outside has seen you. And bad enough on the 39, the GT3 car, where there is a bit of a performance advantage, but trying to come past another DPI down there, Interesting is all I'm going to say. I'll, I'll give Kevin his due. He, he hasn't hit anybody. He's uh, he's driven through. Here's the leader into the pit lane. Shit, Adam. Felipe Nasser coming in for fuel and tires as well as the Acura that started on the second position and has been holding down that second position for a long time. The 10 of Ricky Taylor. It's a driver change for the. Uh, that. That's the Wheel and Engineering and the Acura, both of them doing driver changes. Hippo now in the 31, and it is Philippe Albuquerque into the 10. Konica Minolta Acura, fuel tires, driver change for both. Who's going to get back out into the fast lane first? It should be the 31. The Wheel and Engineering Cadillac does begin to move a slow roll out of the box, but no harm, no foul, because the 10 is still stationary, nowhere near where he rolled. Field nozzle comes out, and away it goes. So the gap maintains. But is that the 60 going through to lead the race? I believe Meyer Shank Racing and their Acura now are in P1. Uh, just checking through. Possibly, yeah. There's a whole bunch of P2s that have gone through as well. Let's see the next timing line uh, and see what uh, car is scored as the leader. I think it might be Ryan DL who's, uh, who's leading, actually. Uh, did the 0-1 come in, Jeremy? He hasn't stopped. The 0-1 zero zero hasn't one. stopped, so that'll be the leader, won't it, until, uh, until, until he stops, time. yeah. Yeah. So... Kevin Magnussen yet to make his next stop. Does he peel off to the right this time around in behind the WeatherTech car? Yes, he does. So, Shea Adam, you have the 0-1 Cadillac coming in. Uh, and uh, also, whilst he's tr trundling towards you at the pit lane speed limit, we've not yet seen the Grasa Lamborghini came in before we even went to Green Shea. Have you got an update on that for us? It's just come back out onto the racetrack after an hour and 20 minutes behind the wall, working on what was an ABS failure on the right front of that car on the out lap. Uh, they have got Misha Goyper going once again, this team, which is out of both the sprint and the full season championship battles. Now just going out to try and get some laps done. All right, the Cadillac stop. Do I see a bright yellow helmet for Renger Van Der Zandt? Yes, I do. The door is open. Kevin Magnuson out of the car and he walks away somewhat casually having done his job so far to try and win this race. Renger getting in and it is four new Michelin tires going on at the car. It's a very casual looking stop though, I have to say. There's not a great deal of urgency from the tire changers once again. Uh, almost as if it's a lazy Sunday instead of a motorsports race day Sunday. But waiting on the fuel, so no time lost. They're at 29, 30, and away goes Renger right on the nose. We'll take the fuel. Yeah, Renger will go to the end of the race after what, around about an hour and 20 minutes, a little over for Kevin Magnussen. He blends back in towards turn one. Glance in the mirrors to see what was coming through. And rejoins the motor race. Right in behind what is quite an interesting battle in GT Daytona ahead of him. He's got the uh, Zach Veach now driven Vassar Sullivan Lexus and a whole bunch of cars ahead of him that he'll have to pick his way through relatively quickly. 
that is the problem. You get dropped out into traffic. You don't have time to ease yourself in, Jeremy, because uh, you've got to immediately start picking your way through, otherwise your outlap's going to be compromised. Indeed so, yeah, and uh, Yashi uh, quite rightly pointed out that the number 60 car has been absolutely flying since its pit stop, but it stopped out of sequence with everybody else, perhaps uh, take on a little bit less fuel to sort of kind of equalise the stops to the end of the race, and they're taking full advantage of that. It's going to be uh, when they finally catch up to and overtake the P2 cars and now leading this race overall, uh, which is uh, Ryan DL. Now eight seconds already ahead of Gabby Obrey, who has overtaken uh, Mikkel Jensen. Uh, and then uh, into fourth position still remains the number 11 car, Tristan Nunez. So the GT, the DPI cars are going to catch that lot before they take over the lead. But Dave Cameron is not only ahead of Pipo Duran, he was ahead by uh, over four seconds. This pit stop for cover, especially for Mike Buchanan who's supporting Re Corvette Racing from his home in the UK, supposed to be at the race, but still can't travel to the US, of course, not uh, allowing guys from the UK to come over. So, Mike, that one's just for you. She'll give us the details in a moment. Hello also to Brittany Tandy, strategising in Bedfordshire from a distance at home with Evie, I think, who is still up at the moment, supporting our dad, who's leading GT Le Mans at the moment. Shea Adam, uh, that last pit stop for Corvette was for the other uh, Corvette racing car, the number three of Tony Ocasi. Yeah, hi, Eva and Felix. That was the uh, yellow car instead of the silver one. It was fuel and tires for Antonio Fair. Garcia. And not, not the gray one, correct. Um, and it was a bit of a wild getaway, too, as uh, Antonio had a bit of a tail slapper going on trying to go through the Michelin RFID at the end of the pit lane, but all managed to rejoin. And now he's smack dab in the middle of a GTD battle. And that is about to kick off as well because they're going to be coming into pit within about the next five minutes. Yes, hello, Eva and Felix in the uh, Tandy household. Very cool racing kids remember that we are a community radio station for uh, motorsport across the world for the uh, families and connections of uh, those at road america this weekend uh, i suspect chelsea jarvis will be listening in as well uh, sunday evening what just after nine o'clock in the uk on central time here at Road America, so a six hour time difference, seven to Central Europe. Thanks for all your support, all the families. I always say this at various times of the year, but whether we're covering races or the teams and the support staff out there, can't do it without the help of the people that sometimes we have to leave at home. Thank you very much for everything that you do, particularly when we can't always be around. I'm told, by the way, a bit of intel from the Tandy household. It's a huge slide there by one of the NSXs going through Turn 14. Excellent piece of parenting there uh, in terms of the family budget for years to come. Uh, both Felix and Eva have been handed a tennis racket from an early age. Excellent. Well done, Brittany. <laughs> well done. Yeah, very good. So, Jeremy starting to get back into a rhythm a little bit now it's uh it's been a little over well getting off for half an hour since we had the last intervention from the safety car and we should be coming as i presume we should be coming into some gt daytona pit stops uh, shortly and this thing have been out for for quite a long time yeah probably won't be too long will it good point 22 uh, we, we laps just, just... for Zach Robichon, yeah, or if you prefer, yeah. uh, 54 minutes, yes, so they're, they're there or thereabouts on. Yeah, not far away at all. And uh, we've just seen the number three Corvette uh, making a pit stop on the on the last lap. It was running in the second position. A uh, little, little ways behind number four car that leapfrogged to the front by virtue of making its first pit stop right before that first caution period, way back on lap uh, 10 of the car was in the pits. So uh, he is leading right now. It's uh, it's still at uh, the wheel of the uh, number four car is uh, Nick Tandy, and he's 
doing a nice job to extend that that gap over over the sister car who was kind of holding up the number 79 as well uh, but pit stop now amongst the, the leading lmp2 cars number 18 car pits this time so number 52 michael jensen goes into the lead of the race we complete lap uh, 38 now 39 by the race leader 156.3 for Mikkel Jensen, the fastest car of the race for that car, 56-0. So good lap there for the Danish driver. Dane Cameron now up into second position, only about five seconds behind uh, and a little bit, uh, just under five seconds ahead of Pippo Durrani, currently running third at the road, on the road at the moment. Don't forget the chequered flag ends the race, but only starts our conversation, Michelin Post Race Tech with uh, Shane, Jeremy and myself answering your questions. The original listener-defined radio show at IMSA Radio, hashtag Mission and PRT. Uh, Ollie asking about the differences between LMP2 in the WEC and IMSA. We'll go into that in as much detail as you'd like at the end of the race, Ollie. There are very few, suffice to say, there's a bit of uh, performance difference in terms of uh, balance of performance. And the LMP2s in uh, WEC now quite a bit heavier. They also run on a different tyre in the WEC. That's the short version. If Johnny Palmer was here, he'd tell you exactly how many kilowatts difference there were and what the weight difference were. The, the LMP2 cars in the WEC running about 100 kilos heavier than they were designed to be and they're, they're running only a couple of kilos lighter than the uh, alpine lmp1 car uh, this season in an effort to make them less competitive and less worrisome for the aco hypercars hello to ashton norling who is being part of our technical team at trackside for a wee while now. This is uh, last time as part of our team before he goes and joins a very big team. He signed up to serve his country. Everybody's very proud of you, Ashton. We wish you well. Thank you very much indeed from all of us. I know we haven't always been able to see you in the last few races, but we appreciate your efforts for us and what you're going to do as well. Godspeed. All the best, mate. For that, one of our hard-working technical team at the track on his final outing in the IMSA uniform before, with all due respect to IMSA, he trains up a little bit. Good luck, fella. IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, the IMSA Sports Car Weekend at Road America. And as he has done since the drop of the green flag, after capturing pole position, 31 wheeling competition car now driven by people Durrani in second place actually I was about to say still leading but it's in second place in class and uh, we have an LMP2 car at the head of the standings and that is Michael Jensen from PR1 Matheson Motorsport that Origa Cameron second but leading P1 excuse me P1 that's your bit it's DPI uh, and P. Futurani now in second by about another three seconds with Philippe Albuquerque in the Conning of Minolta ARX Acura to take car in third as they go across the line. So LMP2 car being leading for a little while. Shea, go ahead. Uh, you just said that because Dean Cameron is fast enough to be an LMP1 car. That's true enough. Uh, we were talking about this in our earlier programmes that these cars... Um, a heck of a lot cheaper to buy and run, a heck of a lot cheaper to develop. But Jeremy, in, in terms of their race pace, not a million miles away from the million euro or whatever they were, Audis and Peugeots with a thousand horsepower, pretty much half of that. Uh, aero downforce to give away and huge tyres. These are great racing cars and they race well together. Saying they were only about what four or five, five or six seconds away from the race pace of those behemoths from a few years ago. Uh, that's right, John. The, the race lap record back in the day in 2008 was Marco Werner, 148.7. 
That was uh, an average of 134 oh. miles an hour, the, uh, which is, in fact, the pole record by Dane Cameron two years ago was fractionally quicker than that, 148.715. Uh, the, wow. the race lap record here also stands in, in uh, for DPI, also stands to Dane Cameron at a 51.0. So a couple of seconds away from Marco Werner's time, but as you say, a, a massive difference uh, in the, the budgets between those two cars. And the fastest lap in, in this race so far has been set by Dane Cameron again, he loves this place, a 151.7. So a little bit away from the time he set last year to set the race lap record here, but he's out in front now. He's just overtaken the, the first few cars, just overtaken the number 52, which is actually making its pit stop. It was leading for uh, three or four laps. That would have been fun for Mikkel Jensen, but he brings that PR1 Matheson Motorsports car out of the lead overall and in P2 to make its scheduled pit stop. Shea Adam, uh, VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter, will watch this one and describe what goes in, uh, goes in, comes out or comes off that number 52 <laughs> car. Uh, tires come off, extra drinks bottle goes in with a very long straw for Mikkel Jensen. Not saying that the drinks bottle in the car isn't working necessarily, but maybe it needs a little bit extra cool fluids. Still waiting on the fuel as the driver's side door has gone back down. Quick clean of the windshield as well, not taking a tear off, cleaning out the radiator ducts at the front of the car. Moving around the car with the hands held up are the mechanics waiting for the fuel to come out. And it is a long stop in terms of fuel, but everything else has gone perfectly for this stop. In talking to Ben Keating earlier on, he did mention how much help Michael Jensen has been to try and get up to speed with this car at this track. Ben Keating, who's won here many times before in different GT cars, says it's a very different track when you're behind the wheel of a prototype. And Michael Jensen's experience, even though he's never been to Road America before, so much so that it was able to help Keating, his co-driver, get the pole position. Not, not going to be a million miles, Jeremy, of making that his, his last stop in that car. We've got an hour and four minutes to go. I'm going to need a huge amount of, of yellow flag to get him to the end in that LMP3 car. I've just been looking through the the early stints, um, okay, with a, a few yellow laps involved, seven yellow laps involved for the Wolver Racing. Uh, Algie Pabst car, he did an hour and two minutes, an hour and three minutes. John Andretti earlier on uh, with a few more laps, did an hour and seven with uh, nine yellow flags lap. So I just yeah. need a splash at the end for that car. No, no, he'll, he'll need to stop. He'll need to stop uh, from here probably about 15 minutes or so before the end of the race. Uh, so it'll, it'll need a long caution period. Yeah, remember, of course, around here, caution laps take a long time. That's a good point. Um, behind the safety car, uh, much more so that uh, because the track is so long, of course, and the safety car, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty quick, pretty quick car, but it isn't anything like racing speed. So there's a much bigger difference here than, than many other tracks. So around about 40 minutes or so, they can do uh, the uh, DP, the LMP2 cars, pretty similar fuel range actually to the DPIs. I'll keep an eye uh, on that and see how they go. Well, all of a sudden, that uh, traffic for the number 60 car, Dane Cameron, and Pippo Durrani now uh, only about a, a less than two seconds behind him. Uh, and right behind Durrani is all, all of a sudden Philippe Albuquerque in car number 10 as well. It, those two have been pretty much not quite nose to tail, but uh, one behind the other all the way through this race so far, which now stretches for an hour and 37, just over an hour remaining, as you say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, looking at some of the other P2 cars. I was looking at P3s there, Jeremy, my apologies. Uh, 42, 44 minutes for those Cars. So, yeah, you're spot on. So he's going to have a little splash towards the end. Question for me now will be uh, how far can everybody else uh, who hasn't stopped yet? Felipe Fraga in the Riley number 74 orders a stop. He's been out there 35 minutes of full green. So he can't be a million miles away. Same for uh, Dylan Murray. Riley, the other Riley Motorsports, number 91 uh, car. So if it's, let me, uh, sorry, let me go back with me. Two cars. How long has Tristan gone? Tristan's just been out. Tristan, Tristan, yeah, 53, but that was a bit of help. 
all right let's keep let's keep an eye on some of those prototype stints uh, and see how they get on because uh, that is still the strategy to be played out we talked in our michelin counts and the green about our portion keys to the race and keeping a flexible strategy particularly on such a long circuit always sensible but those fuel numbers as jeremy said super important for the four mile lap and, and how quickly things change around here. I mean, all of a sudden now, we've got the top four cars covered by just over three and a half seconds. Uh, I mean, just uh, three laps ago, it was more than that between first and second, and the others were, stre were spread out behind them. So, you know, the, as they've worked their way through the traffic, uh, Dane Cameron has been, uh, has lost the most amount of ground compared to everybody else. And he's now got Pipo Durrani right on his rear wing. Just uh, a note that in the pit lane from the lead in GT Le Mans, Matt Campbell and the WeatherTech Racing Porsche has been and gone share and news of, uh, yeah, we talked about this in our Porsche case the race as well, no mistakes, particularly not in the pits, what can you tell us? Car four was in the pit lane to do fuel tires and a driver change. Tommy Milner taking over for Nick Tandy. They just served a drive through penalty as well. Wheel rotation while on the jack stands. That's heavy. Oh dear. Oh dear. That is a no no. So coming down to the first corner now is what has become, Jeremy, the battle for the lead. Dan Cameron for Acura battling the red white Cadillac of P. Portorani, 60 from 31. And they're only a second and a half away from the second of the Acuras, Philippe Albuquerque, in the number 10 car. We'll keep an eye on that as they go around the track. They've got uh, quite a bit of traffic to negotiate shortly as we get some GTD pit stops. We said they weren't a million miles away and in has come the right motorsport Porsche and the Vassar Sullivan number 14 Lexus RCF. Share Adam. It's bill power time for the 96 Turner Motorsport BMW. They've been in and out and installed bill in place of Robbie Foley. We've got Patrick Long jumping into the 16 Red Motorsport Porsche for the last time that I will say it. Happy belated 40th birthday, Patrick. I say the number because he's getting in the car and can't hear me. It is Jack Hawksworth who is being installed into the 14 Lexus in place of Aaron Tealitz. We've got Richard Highstand into the pit lane. I would imagine he would be walking up a few boxes to go have a chat with somebody in uh, the 01 pits, but Jeff Westfold will be taking that Audi back out for Carbon. Andy Lally is in for fuel and tires. He was behind Catherine Legg uh, for quite a few laps there out on the track. The two of them having a very good battle. Shane Lewis has brought in the Mercedes. The number 32 machine will be handing over to Guy Cosmo. Brian Sellers is back in for a splash of fuel, a small splash of fuel to go to the end and a set of new tires. And we are expecting Roman DeAngelis and Zach Robichon and Till Bechtelsheimer all to come down the pit lane here shortly because they are still the starting drivers. And we have not yet seen Lawrence Vantor, Ross Gunn, or Mark Miller in any of those cars. Shit, Adam, with that VP Racing Fuel pit report. Let's catch up on some of the other cars. Tristan Nunes been driving very nicely in the blue and yellow number 11 win. Autosport Origa, and a two car, fastest lap of that category at the moment, a 55-3, 55-9 last time around for Michael Jensen, out of the pits in the 52, the wins, PR1 Matheson Motorsport car, so that the win Autosport is the blue car, spelled W-I-N, and Michael Jensen, the PR1 Matheson Motorsport, is the uh, purple rainbow car, and that's the wins, W-Y-N-N, apostrophe S car. Here comes the Faf Porsche from the lead. In fact, looks like the top four or five are coming in from GT Daytona. Shea Adams, you've got your... Shea Adam, you have your hands full. <laughs> I didn't say Shea Adam, Just you have your hand full. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, if there were more of me, we could watch all the stops at once. But no, uh, Zach Rojan out of the Fat Motorsport Porsche and Larry, who had the painful experience of trying to put a helmet on with a broken nose, ow, 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 has now been installed into that Porsche, just waiting on fuel. And the passenger side door is currently open as well. Uh, that would be a drinks bottle change for Larry. That got done, waiting for the fuel probe to come out. And that Porsche will be sent. Phenomenal job by Fat Motorsports today. Back for their second time racing at Road America. This could be their second consecutive 
consecutive win as well for the north of the border team. Hey, Canada already got gold once this week. Uh, Roman DeAngelis brought in the heart of racing Aston Martin fuel and tires for that car. And Zach, uh, sorry, Ross Gunn installed behind the wheel now. And the GRT Lamborghini has a flat tire and is continuing uh, slowly around the track. I don't think so, Cher. Actually, coming down to Canada corner, I think it's something catching. I think he's been off the track and hit something. Uh, left rear damage on that car, but it looks to me as if the Michelin still has air back there and the rear bodywork looks slightly, slightly Oliver uh, askew. Uh, it's a bit askew at the moment. Yeah, there's definitely rubbing on the, the left rear and that car comes back into the pits. This is the car that uh, took a long time to get into the race and he's had a tap, I think. Oh, just the slightest of tap from the third place Corvette. That's Tommy Milner. Yeah, it's far. Oh, he had a big wiggle right in the middle of the carousel and then a little tap from the Corvette. So was there something on the suspension already ailing that car that began to get loose? And that's why he got sideways oh. and had the tap from the Corvette. But there's definitely just bodywork rubbing there on the left rear. Sorry, Cher, I interrupted your flow. Oh, uh, that's all right. We uh, had also down the pit lane the 76 Compass Racing Acura, Mario Van Barker Fuel and Tires. We've now got the NTE Audi down the pit lane, J.R. Hildebrand taking on Fuel and Tires as well. And uh, Mark Miller took over the Gradient Racing Acura after a great opening stint from Till Bechtelsheimer doing super quick times. I have bad news to report, though. The 32 Gilbert Cawthorn Mercedes will be coming back down the pit lane. They left their box with pit equipment attached. That is a major no-no. Oh, dear. Another off on the grass. We said keep off the grass. And that's the Andretti Autosport car. And off again at the kink as well as the 55 Mazda went through. Pits that car. The Andretti car? Yes. Right, OK. So that was a driver change then as well uh, for that car. So that was Oliver Askew uh, behind the wheel of that car. Came back onto the racing line to find a master there. Already been off the track. He's actually been quite fortunate there, I think, Jeremy. But Oliver's a very good driver. He'll forget about that and knuckle down. Fifth position. And the reason I said Askew, by the way, as I did hear somebody call him Oliver Askew the other day, and I thought, no, the car's in perfectly good shape. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> So that was stored away for, for later. It's not, it's not Askew, it's dead straight, that car, and it still is. Meantime, the 32 circulating as well after a near moment coming out of the pit lane. In fact, ah, yes, that was the uh, piece of equipment, I think, Shea, that's come off that car. The uh, GT, it's a drinks bottle, I think. Yeah, it is. It's a pressurised drinks bottle that popped out of that car. Now, does that count as a bit of pit equipment that wasn't fitted properly? Yeah. Or uh, uh, perhaps the... Uh, the outgoing one wasn't disposed of properly. Flicked away like a Tour de France rider in a peloton as they'd gone past a feeding station. That car is back into the pit lane. This is the Guy Cosmo-driven Gilbert Kothoff Motorsport Mercedes MG GT3. He has got his drinks bottle fastened in to the spot in the door to his left exactly where it's meant to be. So I presume, Shea, that was the empty one that was shot across the track as he came out of pit lane for the first time of asking. Correct, but it doesn't make sense as to where the placement would have been on the car for it to depart the vehicle at that point in the circuit. <laughs> Unless somebody just left it on the back and forgot to tidy it away as he pulled out. Strange Or on the windshield. Happened. Well, yeah, they put it somewhere, haven't they? Yeah. Let's come on. Who among us hasn't driven away with a cup of coffee or a cell phone on the roof when you've been doing something or, you know, your burger order? We've all done it. I don't believe it if you say you haven't done that. If you haven't, you will. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. <laughs> Sage words from Shaw as we, as Jeremy and I approach our, our autumn years ourselves. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah. Alyssa, uh, who's working hard up at uh, 
Mission Control at NASCAR Productions at uh, Charlotte says, I have never done that, and so does the responsible adult. Trust me, ladies, it is a matter of time and mental capacity. It will cast, catch up with you. I'm not having that it's only a bloke thing. I am not having it. I guarantee some, I guarantee some other people have done it uh, as well. 51 minutes to go. Let's get back to the racing. Heart of racing. Aston Martin. Been having a good run of lately. Ross Good of late. Ross Good sitting in a creditable sixth position overall. Or sixth position in their class, should I say. They seem to have the ability, Jeremy, of finding pace at the end of the race and stealthing onto the podium positions and a lot of that has been done yes by great driving particularly by the man who's behind the wheel now the Aston Martin junior uh, Ross Gunn but they also just seem to get their strategy calls right yeah they don't make many mistakes do they it's uh, it's been a, just a tremendous season for that heart racing team um, I mean yeah, they're just uh, ticking all the boxes making no mistakes and uh, you know they're running in the sixth position at the moment Catherine Legg is uh, she's she on the pit lane right now? She just made her pit stop. Okay, so the the Porsche uh, stayed out a little bit longer than everybody else. So that means she's got now just 50 minutes remaining in this race. Comes uh, pits out of the lead. I'll put Lawrence Vantour back in the lead of this race by five seconds over Bill Arblin. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. Never easy to hunt down Bill Arblin at the best of times, but. Uh, if he's looking for a podium position or better, uh, good luck with that. Uh, Lawrence Vanto just going across the line. Bill Orbelin uh, and, and posting that car's fastest time, 208.950. And that Bill Orbelin's just done a 208.928. Still five and a half seconds behind. And that, in fact, is the fastest lap of the GTD race. So just underlining, Jeremy, what I was saying about... Uh, Orbelin, who's just popped up in the second position there after those pit stops. Chase down Pat Long, ch chase down Bill Orbelin. Good effort for anybody who's trying to do that at the moment, particularly when they're in uh, podium spots. Yeah, I'm just looking at when, when the last uh, time number 60 car was on pit lane was uh, half an hour and 13 minutes, so that car, oh, it's... He's like, he stayed that a lot longer than I thought he would, actually. Uh, that was the, the last pitted on that. Uh, that DPI, yeah, 31. Yeah. Um, so uh, he's uh, getting a good few miles there, but... Uh, 36 minutes. minutes. Yeah. 36 minutes, he's been out, 48 minutes to go. He's done yeah. 19 laps uh, on this. So... Yeah, wow. My maths is really good, he... right? But, Jeremy, your point is well made there because if he can get another two or three laps, he's only going to have the same distance again to go. So that will be yeah. his last pit stop. And I think he'll be the first of the leaders to make his last pit stop. Never he, he a bad thing be, to do. No, that's exactly right. He will be the first. I, 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 I'm pretty sure that when they when that car came into the pits on lap 31, uh, which was with um, an hour and... Uh, Brains, brains dead this time but at that point I'm sure they, they planned they could get to the end of the race from there with just the one more pit stop that, that was a hope anyhow uh, if they needed caution periods in there uh, right now they've been out of luck so uh, they've uh, 51 laps completed 47 minutes remaining if they can do another yeah, three laps which I think it's going to be a stretch uh, then they can they can they should be able to get to the end but uh, we'll see yeah, agree with that, Jeremy. Yeah, I, I, I saw where you were going with that as you were sort of adding it up in, in your mind, and you, you're spot on. They could be the first to make their last pit stops, and that is... They will be the first to make the last stops, I think. They were in three laps before anybody else in DPI. Yeah. It, I, you know, it's sometimes we look at that and say, oh, you know, he's been in early. But if you've been back counting, seeing this in races at the Nürburgring, you think, why are they coming in now? But they've divided the race up into manageable chunks. Now, sometimes that becomes because of slow zones there or safety cars here. But you've got to make it work. You 
just got to yeah, make it that, work with what you've got. That's right. Uh, but uh, you know, I think the reason that, that, that the uh, the margin that car had uh, a little while ago, it shrunk so quickly, was the fact that he was saved really easy even now. So this is 52, that's, this is 46 minutes remaining in the race. That's uh, that's a big stretch. Now, now it doesn't look so good, shit, Adam, because I'm not sure they can go at the end, certainly not at full speed from here. They may need a splash at the end or a help from the intervention of the C8 safety car. 60 DPI comes in from the lead to share Adam. No, but an even bigger question mark is the number five. Mustang sampling Cadillac coming in the lap before for Lloyd Duval trying to stretch it to the end of the race. And when you're already in last, it's less of a gamble than when you come in from the lead. They are doing fuel and brand new shiny Michelin tires for Dane Cameron. I've got a feel for Mike Shank. He's on a pit box right now in Nashville, Tennessee, missing this race, probably watching and listening to us on Sirius XM. But not being here and seeing your car at the front of the field, it's got to be even more nerve wracking, not knowing what the fuel numbers are than if you were sitting on the pit box, knowing that the fuel numbers were possible to make it to the end, maybe. Maybe. Informed. But that was a 40 minute stint there for a Dane Cameron. Uh, and we've got 45 minutes remaining in this race. So if he's going to get to the end from here, he's going to need a caution period. Right now, Pippo Durrani, having been unleashed, he was kind of trapped behind the number 60 car for, for several laps now. We'll see what sort of lap times Pippo can produce here before he uh, comes into the pit stop. I would expect in probably another couple of laps time. Release the people. Good, good, good to go from there. Yeah, release the people. That was a 21 lap stint for Dan Cameron in the number 60. Accurate. Currently, people working his 18th lap across the line. He goes. That rumble of the Cadillac motor behind him. Down towards the first corner. 2.7 there, 1 minute 52.7 for Pippo Durrani. Uh, they'd been doing 54s and f mainly 54s uh, the last uh, half dozen laps or so. So all of a sudden he's found a you know, second and a half there compared to the pace he had been running when he was, just, he was running behind the number 60 uh, Maya Shank Racing uh, uh, Acura. And now he's, he's already extended a margin over to. Uh, Number 10 car behind him by a few tenths of a second on that lap. Uh, yeah, seven tenths of a second on, on that lap. So the gap out to, to over two seconds now between the number 31 car and the number 10 currently running in second place. A couple of cars that have uh, dropped down the standings recently, not just by sheer. The, the 70. Six. I'm just seeing where they are. Mario Farnback of the Compass Racing Accurate. He was looking at the big slide earlier on that I was watching. So I wonder if he's in tyre trouble. Uh, and Jar Hildebrand for NT Sport and the Audi, the 42. Now, they were together on track, I think. And Shea, the fourth dropped down a wee bit. What's going on there? They were battling for sixth position. Now Farnbacher is down in 13th, Hildebrand in 11th. They lost a bunch of positions together over one lap, but Farnbacher is now down even further. Um, the problem can't be tire related though, John, because they've only been out of the pits for 13 and 10 minutes respectively. Okay. So perhaps some kind of RG and perhaps even a bit of Barchi as well between those two the line for Philippe Albuquerque, who's now behind the wheel of the Cunningham and Older Acura DPI, the number 10 car, 2.2 seconds away from the lead. Several cars between them, including Farnbacher, who is going by now. Oh, is that? Yeah, it was. Down towards turn three. Uh, where is our leader at the moment? On the middle straight, heading to, down towards turn five. Lots of traffic in there as well and ahead of the leader the next car he's going to have to go by and there's a people to of course behind the wheel of that car looks like did i get a glimpse there well actually there's a huge gaggle of cars people's about to come to last i was trying to pick numbers out on the tracker 
causing it a little bit of a problem. Going past the Lexus, that's the number 12 car. Around the outside. Now, you know, that's all right. Around the carousel, the prototypes can go and ride the outside berm there. They've got a wee bit more downforce, quite a lot of more downforce. So that was uh, a good pass from Durrani as he heads down towards Canada Corner. Got a bit of a gap ahead of him before the Riley number 74 prototype, who's in a battle. In, and he's just going up the start finish ramp now to the to the line. Now, who's that in the pit lane? Is that the leader coming in? To run? It should be. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, yes, it, of course, it should be to uh, yeah, 39 minutes, 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 yeah. 39 minutes on that stint, 40 minutes remaining. I'd say that was about perfect, Mr Short. I would say so. Absolutely right. And that'll put uh, Philip Albuquerque in the lead. So he's going to do uh, uh, one more lap than the 31 car. Last time around, they both pitted on lap 35. Uh, the 01 car came in one lap after number 31 and the number 10. Uh, so uh, that's interesting, something to keep an eye on. Just give a little bit more of a, of a fuel margin towards the end of the race. Number six the car, I think for sure, is going to need a full course caution to get to the end without needing another stop. Here is the number, the third place car, or well, second place car now actually, with the number 31 car having pitted. The 55 Mazda also onto pit lane. Shea Adam has the update on Mario Farmbacker in the uh, number 76 NSX. My eternal thanks to Jill Thompson for getting back to me so quickly. It is a tire issue, but not the normal kind. They're having issues getting the tire up to temperature. Mario says it is making the car undrivable. It won't turn. It is, quote, not the same car. The only change that they made in that stop was tires. Uh, meanwhile, the pit stops go on for DPI. It was fuel and tires for Harry Tignall, who gets out of the pit lane just behind Pippo Durrani in the Whalen Engineering Cadillac. The battle is still on. Oh, yeah, really is. It's interesting, isn't it, Jeremy? Some cars have a very wide operating window or envelope. Uh, that NSX seems not to have. It, it often looks quite edgy, and it's not the first time I've heard some of the teams running it saying that they can't find the balance to either turn the tyres on or get the longevity out of them. But turning the tyres on, that means getting the tyres up to temperature and pressure and getting them working with the chassis. And if it's not doing that, that might just be a change in the temperature of the, of the track or something like that, Jeremy. But if it's not doing anything, what do you tell the driver to do? Because you can't really tell him to keep spinning the rear tyres up. Uh, on Zero one car just uh, just it was honest. indeed that's Renger van der Zander who's in the yeah. lead of the race at the moment I mean, and he's in the gravel he, at turn five but he's driven out of it. That's the car that uh, would be uh, leading the race, but uh, he's uh, stretching his fuel load and trying to run as fast as he can before making that final pit stop. But that's cost him a lot of ground. So number ten car comes into the pits. Shit. Philippe Albuquerque staying aboard this car, fuel and tires for the actor as they go for their second consecutive manufacturer win at Road America. Wayne Taylor still trying to get the first ever win for his team at this track, the last one on the schedule, I believe, where they do not yet have a win. But for Philippe Albuquerque, all he cares about is getting back out in front, fresh tires, getting heat into them nicely, and making the fuel last another 38 minutes worth of time. But the other thing that's coming into play, rain is expecting within the next 30 minutes. So if you walk up and down the pit lane right now, you see it on everybody's radar. Philippe comes back out into the third position. You are such a little black red guy and sometimes share, Adam. Uh, just a point about van der Zander, he did take over that car one lap later than Philippe Albuquerque. So next time around, he would have done the same amount of laps and therefore time near enough as Philippe Albuquerque uh, having just stopped. So, but that little whoopsie down at turn five does not do his chances of jumping anybody in the pit lane any good at all. Also got GT Le Mans pit stops as well. Corvette in the lane, Chip. 
Antonio Garcia getting a fresh set of boots. Corvette Racing is one of those teams, by the way, that sent me a picture of their radar, so they're watching it very closely. Using this race not only as a championship event, but as a test for the 24 hours of the ball coming up next week for this crew. They'll all be getting on planes and flying over. And for Antonio, right now, he's just flying back out onto the track. Ranger Van de Zanda is into the pit lane in the last of our DPI stoppers. So the Cadillac that is gray with the red accents on it uh, bearing a new sponsor this week as a matter of fact the performance academy cadillac and renger will be staying aboard he is going to show just what kind of performance this car has up its sleeve with fuel and four sticker michelin tires to go on share adam avp racing fuel pit paddock reporter so this is an easy a run to the end from here 38 minutes is what we've seen so far Fewer than that on the clock right now. Uh, and don't forget, after the check and flag, we stay on the air on IMSA Radio for Michelin Post Race Tech. Questions already coming in. Hashtag Michelin PRT at IMSA Radio. Thanks to all of you who've already been asking the questions. Got a chat about Le Mans coming up. Uh, that's uh, Le Mans effectively starting a week today. Haggerty Radio Le Mans fired up for test today on RS1 via RadioLeMans.com, our sister service. And Le Mans programming all the way through test day on the Sunday. Only live coverage that you can get, and it's all live and free. And then special programmes Monday and Tuesday before we cover every single Le Mans 24 session, including the free practice sessions uh, that aren't being covered elsewhere right up to and including the race on Saturday and Sunday. RadioLeMond.com for Haggerty Radio Le Mans 2021. Uh, Tim Gray is our London producer at this weekend. Um, we are going to be doing some Haggerty Radio Le Mans previews, actually. I think they're Monday and Tuesday. Tim, if you can just put on the chat for me if, uh, if that is confirmed and what times they'll be going out. Uh, for me, please. I'll uh, I'll tell the listener that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I know what it is, but it, if I'm certain it's wrong, I'll throw everybody out. Um, I believe they're going to be Monday and Tuesday evening UK time. I'll get it. Uh, get a direct read on that from Tim. And whilst we're talking about things in the future, slightly less far forward, NBCSN. This evening, 8 o'clock Eastern, Brian Till and the rest of the team taking you through this race. Tape delay, set your DVRs if you haven't already done it. Right, Jeremy, getting down towards the last half an hour. This is starting to get interesting, or remain interesting, should I say. This has been fascinating to me. 13 seconds, the gap at the front of the field. Uh, sorry, six seconds, the gap at the front of the field. With people to run into a 39 in the first sector and did cover a 14. They are trading tenths of seconds here at the sharp end of the field. Philippe Albuquerque another five seconds further back, but he's under pressure from the master of Harry Tignell. This one is not over for the podium positions. Uh, it certainly isn't, uh, but certainly the, uh, the, 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 the best placed car right now might not be leading the motor race. Uh, that's the number 60 car, but number 31. Uh, is uh, is ahead of everybody else, and I'm pretty sure, unless there's a full course caution, Dane Cameron is not going to be able to do, to get to the finish of this race on this tank of fuel. So uh, he's going to you know, hope that there is a full course caution. I uh, hope we won't have to engineer one. Um, but uh, that's about his only hope right now. And uh, the battle for uh, second place is now three and a half seconds between the, the number uh, 31 and number 10 is ahead of number 55 so the orders ha has not changed in this latest round of pit stops the only thing that has changed is the fact that uh, dane cameron has a bigger lead over the number 31 and that doesn't alter the fact that unless there's a full course caution or unless this rain comes uh, he's going to be he's going to be struggling yeah still sun shining at the moment and 32 minutes still to go. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern, tomorrow and Tuesday. 
for the Haggerty Ridge Ullamont previews. Full show on prototypes, full show on GTs. So tune in there. RedUllamont.com, RS1, and Shea Adam joining the voice of the WEC and ELMS for us on the RSL, Johnny Palmer and me, John Hindhoff, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre for our two Le Mans programmes, one at three o'clock Monday, one at three o'clock Tuesday, four Eastern times. That's eight o'clock if you're in the UK. Uh, excuse me. Three o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern, eight o'clock in the UK. Yeah. So, Dan Cameron, 11.9 seconds to the good. And as Jeremy says, he is some, what, uh, three laps, or if you prefer, about six minutes. Yeah, a bit more, six or seven minutes worse off than the cars chasing him. So it's got to be advantage at the moment, Jeremy, the Pete Durrani driven 31. Now, conventional wisdom would say, ease off, you don't have to push. But he's got cars behind him that he's got to battle against. And also, you never know what's going to happen. So closing down at the front of the field is never the worst thing to do. But he's got Philippe Albuquerque gaining on him and Harry Tignell gaining on him as well. Second, third and fourth within a couple of seconds now. That's exactly right, John. They've just had to work their way through all the GTD cars again. Uh, and uh, it was certainly Pippa Durrani that uh, came off the worst leg. He lost a five seconds on one lap to the uh, overall leader, uh, Dane Cameron. And as a result of that, the other two were able to uh, take advantage of the fact it was the 31 car that had to pass those traffic first. So that the, tra the, tra the, the drivers at the wheel of those GTD cars saw what was coming up behind, they able to get out of the way uh, a little bit. And uh, so uh, they were able to, to, to gain a little bit closer to the number 31 car, but it's certainly just you know, a second and a half or so covering those well, the second, third, and fourth place cars right now. Uh, these are very, very nervous moments for all of the teams. Our Porsche keys the race. Started with two hours 40 on the clock. Teams looking for a flexible strategy that they could adapt to changing conditions when we have had intervention by the Corvette C8 safety car, but only twice for a total of about 25 minutes. Some teams have managed that slightly better than others. Fuel strategy now. With battles down the field, really, you want to be able to tell your driver, turn it up to 11 and go full rich. And that's exactly what Harry Tignell is doing right now. As he battles Philippe Albuquerque. The white Mazda in fourth position overall, and in DPI, Philippe Albuquerque in the blue and black Acura through the kink down the Canada corner. They were side by side for a moment at the carousel. Neither of those are lifting and coasting down to Canada corner. This is a full race with 28 and a half minutes to go. This could be an absolute barnstormer. against Harry Tinknell, very accomplished driver. And he and Ollie Jarvis have made a very good team for Mazda. As we've been talking about, that's not continuing after the end of this year. What a higher they would be, either as individuals or a team, for anybody wishing to compete in IMSA in the future. I suspect that there might be some talks going on, Multimatic running or building, should I say, the Volkswagen AG chassis for the new global prototypes for the IMSA side of things. As many as 12 or 14 is what we've been hearing. Audi and for Porsche, both here in IMSA and in the WEC, plus four customer cars for Porsche in the first year. Christian Reid from Frogon wants to get his hands on. I suspect there's a queue forming at Vysak even as we speak. Lamborghini likely to jump in in 24, assuming that the ACO will 
allow them to race those cars in the Asian Le Mans series. That's what they've been asking for. Tingle very, very quick coming through turn eight into the carousel and once again got half alongside the Acura in front of Philippe Albuquerque. Sensibly not trying to press it there. He's got a good run through the kink, just did get a little bit of aero wash in the front end, pushing to the left hand side. Now down to Canada corner again. The concentration from both drivers here, Jeremy, outstanding. Because this is as close as you want to be through traffic, through some of the tough downhill braking areas. And Tinkle was right there, right up alongside for a couple of laps. Did the old crisscross, almost ran into the back of him, but not quite as they went into the carousel the last couple of times. Great stuff. Yeah, great stuff. A big twitch there from Albuquerque as he turned into the carousel as well on a slightly tighter line. But, uh, you know, it's, it, these cars are so, so closely matched. It's really going to take some sort of a, a traffic intervention, I think, for anybody to make a pass right now. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I don't see any... It's going to take something, something out of the ordinary for somebody to make a pass around here. Uh, Dan Cameron, he leads this race pretty comfortable right now but I'm pretty sure he is going to require a pit stop before the end of this race if we stay under green, if the sun keeps on shining here. Uh, in the meantime, in GTLM, we just saw a pit stop for the uh, number four car uh, with um, the number 79. Now, uh, still still leading to head in any case uh, prior to that uh, pit stop Correct. by the number four car. Number four three car, lost so that's the Porsche, the ground. Yeah, Porsche still leading from Corvette. Did that? Yeah. Was that? Did they need that stop, then, Jeremy, in the uh, three Corvette? Uh, the, four, that, the three car was in about four laps ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, five correct, laps correct. ago. Sorry, yes. Uh, the yes, number yes, four yes, car yes, was in. Well, the four car was in on 16, that 42. 16 laps ago. That shouldn't have needed to stop. Tom Milner shouldn't have needed to stop. Not now, at least. Now, whether he could go at the end is a different, different matter. Uh, yeah, that was the number 79 car last time. I was in just one lap after the number four car. But as you say, uh, I think they can go a bit longer than that uh, on a stint of fuel. That's curious. It may be that we're trying to get out into clear air, um, knowing that the 79 Porsche still has to make a stop uh, before the end. I mean, they have done an hour and four minutes uh, in the uh, 79 Porsche, but that was yellow, uh, yellow affected there. Uh, Shea Adam, I heard a plaintive cry from our pit lane reporter there. Albuquerque is in. I was not expecting to see Philippe come in. Uh, definitely not at this stage of the race. He had been in not very long ago. I feel like it's been maybe 15 minutes since I last saw this car down the lane. Uh, this should be a splash of fuel only for the Wayne Taylor Racing Organization. But they do still have an extra set of tires. Are they going to put them on? Uh, no, no, just, just fuel, just fuel, just the splash. No, they are doing fuel. They're doing a rear tire, puncture. left rear, so this had to have been an issue. Yeah, correct. They must have had a puncture or a slow puncture. You were spot on, Shane, 13 minutes since the last stop. So the cars have tire pressure sensors uh, on them. So either the driver felt something or they saw something on the data there, Jeremy. This is a, a circuit that you, you can't roll the dice on safety for anything, of course, but particularly not here with the 180 mile an hour speeds that these guys are getting up to. No, uh, you don't take any chances here, that's for sure. Uh, so uh, that's going to, they, they had enough fuel to get to the end, no question about that. Uh, that was a very much an unscheduled stop. Uh, and did, I think it just changed the one tire, didn't they, and sent it on his way. Left rear. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. So yeah, coming down. Championship leader. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good and point. again, again, yeah, that team we Shay talked about a little while ago, uh, the uh, Conic and Minolta Wayne Taylor racing team, still looking for its first win here at Road America. And it's, uh, unless something very, very bizarre happens now, it's not going to come this afternoon. Dan Cameron now being out for 22 minutes. And with 22 to go. Uh, doesn't take an arithmetic genius to realise he's going to have to do something around 45 minutes, even if he crosses the line just before the checkered flag comes out. So Cameron 
It's going to be tough for him to do that. Stint before was a 40 minute stint almost on the nose. So how much can he soft pedal that car? It's no use starting it now. If they were going to tell him to save five minutes worth of fuel, which is, I mean, that's three laps, isn't it, really? <laughs> save three yeah. laps of fuel in 20 at laps. At Road America. Yeah, at Road America um, in a 20 lap stint. Um, you know, that that's that's a 10, more than 10% saving. But he had to do that when he first went out. There's no point in telling him halfway through his stint. He's doing a 53 last time around. Did have some traffic. The car's done a 51.7. His gap is 13 and a half seconds. So he will lead the he will lose the lead if he has to splash. So they may have resigned themselves to that. And basically, at that point, maybe he just gets his foot down, tries to build a lead, and therefore loses as little time as possible. But the, unfortunately, the, the two second and third place cars are only really second apart, Jeremy, and then it's only the 2.2 seconds back to Randy van der Zander in the 0-1 Cadillac in fourth place. So he's going to lose at least, he's going to drop down to fourth, possibly even fifth position, depending on the pace of Loic de Val in the number five Cadillac, the dark grey car, if, even if he just has to pit for a splash. So... The left rear tyre was the only tyre changed by the Koninga Minolta Acura. They knew so exactly what flat, they were doing. It? it did not look flat. But just looking at that, was there something embedded in in the sidewall or something there? Uh, uh, it looked like there was something sticking out. I, I wonder if there'd been some side-by-side -side contact and there was some sidewall damage there because I thought I saw something in the second ah, replay well, that we there, got to yeah, see was, ah that was what we saw earlier on wasn't it that when was Tignal the, the, yeah yeah and he moved he kind of moved across there on Tickler. he was he pulling the over under there and Tickler getting alongside the number 10 car heading towards the carousel and the number 10 car definitely moved across into number 55 so and, and certainly the number 55 car did nothing wrong there well, I think that's what's uh, caused that issue. I, I, I just saw something that looked out of true the second time we saw that pit stop there yeah. being replayed for our NBC colleagues, NBCSN colleagues, 8 o'clock uh, Eastern tonight for that show. Uh, and it just looked to me as if... I thought originally there was something stuck in the sporks, but it might have been... Um, my second thought, as I said, was uh, maybe a chunk out of the sidewall there. And either that had been spotted by somebody out on the circuit or they saw some slow puncture readings linkage of the gases inside the tyres curious but it's cost them a good position there Jeremy as you rightly yes. said back down to sixth and a, a minute behind the leader now a minute and change small margins we say this all the time don't we in gt le mans manny campbell leads for weathertech racing having taken over the car from cooper mcneil and what's he got in terms of a gap decent one but I, surely that car's got to stop again before the end the campbell has done 41 minutes in that car You'd expect that car to get to go, didn't you? Yeah. Get an hour out of the GT Le Mans car without any any yellows. Did an hour and five with five laps of yellow, but as you rightly said earlier on, Jeremy, Germany, Jeremy, the uh, the uh, the laps that the safety car laps here are very very long indeed. Uh, this lot includes the battle. For second and third, Pimo Tarani and Harry Tignall. Pimo in the red and white Cadillac going through the exit of the carousel now. The white car with the blue stripe down the middle of 55 is the third place car. They're carving their way through traffic, which will include the GT Le Mans and GTD leaders. 
No, GDD third place car, that was Pat Long that they went through, the two Porsches. That was like Gran Turismo. To the right of one, to the left of the other, extraordinary stuff for that battle. And this is yeah. when multi-class racing really comes alive, Jeremy. Stuff on the line, 16 minutes to go, podium positions in individual classes, and the guys racing through other battles. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, amazing to watch, isn't it? Absolutely right. And the uh, the number zero one car is not far behind there either, in actual fact. As, uh, as uh, Dean Cameron has just put a lap on the LMP2 class leader, Ryan DL. He's about 20 seconds in front of the uh, second place car. That's number eight, the tower most full entry by driven now by Gabriel Aubrey. Mike Michael Jensen is about 10 seconds behind him in third position. Tristan Nunez about 15 seconds behind Jensen in in fourth position. So that's the seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth positions overall. That's the car numbers 18, 8, 52, and 11. So uh, they're not none of them particularly close, but all having a good race so far. And Michael Jensen actually has just set his best lap of this race. Yeah, Alan Prosser. Thank you. Grabbed a couple of frames from our live video stream at imsonradio.com. There was a chunk out of the sidewall uh, of that uh, Conningham and Alta Acura. Uh, also indebted to Steve Tadman, who's watching some of the onboards uh, as well on imsa.com. Wherever you are, you can watch the onboards. A lot of lifting and coasting, apparently, going on for Matt Campbell in the number 79 Porsche. Shea Adam is trying to get to the bottom of this. Any news about whether they think they can make it to the end with 15 minutes to go? Their pit crew is comfortable. They are leaving oh. him out there, and it's because he's running 208s and 209s that they've given him the number to hit. He's been hitting it. It'll be more than an hour, and it's all dependent on where the lead cars are on the track when they cross the start finish as to whether this car will make it up the hill at the end of the race. Well, do you know what? Got to give them their due. They're battling against the might of Corvette Racing. Yeah, they've got a factory Porsche driver in there. This is going to be good practice, Jeremy, for them going to Le Mans when Cooper McNeil, who is not a full-time professional racing driver, is in the pro class at Le Mans with all the works cars. He's got some fine help in the shape of Porsche factory drivers, Earl Bamba and Lawrence Van Toor. But if you're going to play with a big dog, sometimes you've got to do something a little bit differently. And, and fair play to them for that at WeatherTech Racing on, on home ground this weekend. Yeah, very much so, because uh, they had a car that was probably the car that beat last time out at Lightwood Park. And uh, the, when the weather came there, uh, it caused an early conclusion to that race. Uh, it, it, you know, they had no opportunity to take advantage of the... Uh, of the opportunity they seemed to have had so it would be good for them you know they, they, they've, uh, they've they'll have earned this win they quite easily could have had it last time out and perhaps it'll come here this afternoon at road america in front of uh, there's been a super crowd hasn't it still enjoying this nice weather right now though yes yes everybody's enjoying <laughs> 87.9 around the circuit and 454 I scanner frequency XM202 in North America and around the world on IMSAradio.com, RS2, the home of IMSA Radio. Every hour of the day, every day of the week, every week of the month and every month of the year, there's IMSA content playing out on RS2 and on IMSAradio.com. All of the archive is there to download or listen on demand. The race broadcast, feature programmes, insights and much much more all on imsaradio.com the home of all of our imsa content and it's all available free 13 minutes to go Dan cameron now by 11 seconds from tirani in second the mashank racing acura then leading the, the black and purple car from the red and white wheel and engineering cadillac and the white mazda motorsports Mazda number 55, Harry Tinknell, still just about a second away from second position. Very tight indeed. Ryan DL with a commanding lead for Aero Motorsports, the number 18 Blue Oringa in seventh overall, 20 seconds to the good over Gabby Aubrey, who has got the fastest lap of the race in the town, Motorsport number eight Oringa, but 
not making any ground at the moment, lapping within a tenth of a second of Ryan last time around. Mikkel Jensen in the wins coloured PR1 Matheson Motorsport number 52. Another 13 seconds further back and actually dropping away from the leading pair. In P3, Colin Brown for Core Autosport in the lead in 11th position. Rasmus Lind behind the wheel of Performance Tech, Tech Motorsports number 38 car in second. So it's the white and tangerine 54 from the 38 in second, the red and black car. 15 seconds further back, Philippe Fraga for Riley Motorsports in the 74. That's the very bright chrome blue and flame orange car. In GT Le Mans, Matt Campbell for WeatherTech Racing with a very laconic pit crew. Seeing, yeah, Manny, go do it, mate. We're not coming out again, so it's up to you. <laughs> Basically is what they've said. Antonio Garcia in the number three Corvette in second and Tom Milner in the four Corvette in third. And in GT Daytona, it's Porsche as well with Faf Motorsport and the plaid Porsche. Number nine car, Lawrence Vanto by nine seconds over. Bill Orbelin for Turner in the BMW M6 GT3, the number 96, the yellow and blue car. Pat Long makes it to two Porsches in the top three there in GT Daytona with the 16 light blue and black right motorsports car. He's got three seconds on the Vassar Sullivan Lexus. That's the number 14 car that started on pole position. Jack Hawksworth bringing that one home. Oh, an errant wheel on the circuit. And that's the 44 Magnus car that has lost a left-hand rear wheel. Never a good day when parts of your car are doing a different lap time to the rest of it. Now, that is a very odd one. 47 minutes into the stint, and he's gone into the motorcycle cutoff just before the kink, I think. Uh, yeah, exactly where it's happened. Uh, and the left rear wheel has parted company. Now, he's well off the circuit towards some safety vehicles there. I think that'll be all right because there are vehicles parked there. Track services vehicles, Jeremy. That's that's one of the chicanes that the motorcycles use. That car wasn't just out of the pits. That's an odd one for the rear wheel to come detached there. Very much so. He, he's had a, a, a lengthy battle with, with Catherine Legg and uh, number one car of uh, Brian Sellers was involved in that battle as well. Andy Lally behind the actually, way, by the way, I should have said, yes. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and Catherine Legg had actually got past Andy a little while ago, but he was running there in the eighth position. It was a good run for that team. They've, they've really had some struggles this season. But that was a really strange one. But really heads up driving there for, by Andy Lally. You're clear he's done, he does the track walks. He has a good look around. He knew exactly where he was able to take that car. It was a, for, the, for the motorcycles, it's a, uh, it's not just a chicane to the left and right, it's a big dog leg to the left and then back to right again to slow the, the motorcycles down before they get to the kink. Uh, and so he's able to get that car out of the way. But really disappointing day for Andy. So that's uh, 46 races now without a win. Remains the, uh, the most experienced driver in this field. This is 83rd start in this championship, one more than Bill Oblin and Antonio Garcia. And it's been a really disappointing year for for Andy Lally and John Potter, but they did have some fun last weekend. They took uh, one of the cars, I think it's the Audi, they took to uh, Miller Motorsport, well, used to be called Miller Motorsport Park, now Utah Motorsports Complex, I guess, yeah. uh, for a, a NASA six-hour race. And uh, they, were, they were a couple or three other uh, GT3-type cars there, so they had a good old battle there, and they won the race, so uh, that, that was a, a stroke of good luck. And came here, uh, it was a good, solid, competitive run today for the Acura for Magnus with Archangel. It's un unfortunately come to a halt with less than 10 minutes remaining. Shea Adam, late pick callers are going to be the stories of the day here, and we've got one in the DPI class. Look Duval into the pits, and if you remember the last time that this car pitted, a lap later, the 60 came into the pit lane, so our current leader might be getting a little bit nervous at this point. Seven minutes and 45 seconds left on the clock. Rain approaching rapidly. The crew at Shank is hoping that it starts to pour here quickly as uh, there are drops starting to fall on the pit lane. It's coming. Seven and a half minutes. Nobody's going to change tires now. He'll bring it home from here. You're not giving up a position. I guess if you're at the back of the, suppose if you're at the back of the field and you saw a few spots on the, the windscreen at the far side of the circuit, you might take a chance. 
but it's four laps, isn't it? Under four laps at the moment. How far can this shank car go? If Dave Cameron can soft pedal this car from here, Jeremy, this will be a stunning run. Now, being in that car for 38 minutes. So getting on to where we would expect it to stop. So Shea, spot on to uh, to mention, we would expect it in this time around, possibly one more lap. That's going to leave him with probably under six minutes to go, which is three more laps after that. It's a big ask, isn't it, to find that extra fuel within the space of a, a 20, 21 lap stint. Yeah, no, there's no, there's no way. I think uh, they, they were, they were planning on that rain that Shea has been talking about since the, well, before we even started this race. Coming, it was supposed to come about uh, 25 minutes ago. If it had done, they'd have been looking golden, but uh, it hasn't. The sun, uh, we've still got uh, some fairly stark shadows on these cars, so uh, no sign of the rain just yet. Hasn't really eased his pace either, to be honest, Dave Cameron. Still doing the same times as all the cars behind him. Be because he's committed to it. I mean, there's yeah. no way. There's no way he was even by slowing right down. There's no way he's going to save three laps worth of fuel around around here at Road America. So you might as well just run your race and see what happens. And you know, it, was a, it was a good try by this team. Uh, yeah, they've had some some struggles this season, but uh, I think they're going to be showed. And he's, he can he's carry on do one more lap here, but uh, uh, I don't think I I see no way. I might I've been wrong before, admittedly. Um, even me, but uh, I, I think if he can get to the end of here, it would be beyond miraculous. Well, I, I, say exactly the same for Matthew Campbell as well in the 79 WeatherTech Porsche, the white car with the red and blue swooshes uh, on it, because uh, that car's going to have to go a very long way as well. Now, we've had a number of people checking in on the, the live onboards on IMSA.com, available to everybody, by the way, for all our WeatherTech races. There's a degree of lifting and coasting. That means that he's not driving all the way into the braking zone. He's letting off the throttle, more like you would drive a road car, or you should be driving your road car, and lifting up off, letting the car slow down naturally before apply, applying the brakes. Now, it doesn't sound like that would save a lot of fuel, but over the course of the better part of an hour, it is going to make a difference. And Shea Adam, our uh, VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter has news from the pits and part of the circuit. Kelly and Aaron both reporting that raindrops are falling on their heads and we've got news. Jay Kozarek is out around the circuit at turn two and he says rain is falling on him now as well. Four minutes left in this one until the time has expired. That means we could be getting potentially two and a bit more laps. Uh, is it going to dump? It's going to have to be a big one really is it can happen here of course hot tires at the moment four minutes to go leading in the lmp3 category colin brown good run for the core autosport team in the white and tangerine number 54 just sitting outside the top 10 at the moment colin how he's not got a works drive at some stage one of the fastest prototype drivers we've seen in Ibsen down through the years and into the pits with three and a half minutes to go Jeremy Shaw was not wrong this time he said they could make it and they're three and a half minutes that's two that's not even two laps it's one and a half lap short Jeremy for the 60 Shea Adam it's going to be about four or five seconds of fuel if that for the shank number 60 Sirius XM Acura Oh, and it was so close to getting a win, too. If only the race had been a slight bit shorter or run under a slight bit more caution. All right, car comes to a stop. Fuel nozzle in one, two, three, four, five, six away. Six seconds worth of fuel for the 60. So through into the lead, Pete Durrani, the car that started on pole position, having been qualified there by Felipe Nazari's teammate, led the early stances of the race look pretty good out there as well and they have played the strategy game perfectly our Porsche keys to the race said you had to be flexible I suspect one or two plans were slightly bent out of shape with the two safety cars for what 25 26 minutes dependent whether you could use them to your advantage 
the good news for Dave Cameron is he's got this car out of the pit, so with that service completed, well ahead of the number 10 car. They've also, of course, had that unscheduled stop a, a little while uh, for the, for ago. the left rear tyre. Yes, good point, Jeremy. So that's so going to be fourth place yeah. points at the moment for the 60 car. Yeah, uh, which is bad news for the uh, the other, the second of the Acuras, which of course came in here this weekend with the championship points lead. It'll still leave with the championship points lead but um, it'll be uh, reduced somewhat. And the curse of Rhoda Murray for Wayne Taylor Racing continues. Extraordinary to think that they have not won uh, a race here. Still to yes, tick that one off, yeah. Cadillac is about to knock that off the list. They have not won here either. Well, there is just over, now just under four miles to go as Pete Wunderani goes round the first corner. It's got the Riley number 74 down at the bottom of the hill through turn number three for him. That's Felipe Fraga, who he'll have to pass sometime on this final lap. He's only got 2.3 seconds between himself and Harry Tinknell, so he can't afford any mistakes. Tinknell still pushing. No headlights on the master, trying to stealth up behind maybe and sneak up on people to Rani. There have been some last lap dramas here in the past. Out of the final corner, races to the chequered flag. Think back to 2019 and Rebel Rock Racing and the Camaro restarting with a couple of laps to go in eighth position and winning the race. Think of Guy Smith, the 2003 Le Mans winner for Dyson and the dash to the line here. One of the closest finishes on IMSA's record books. He's running in fourth place, so it's not going to be have any consequence whatsoever. It's fourth in LMP2, but uh, it, uh, that car made its last pit on lap 55, which was one lap before the uh, two cars that are leading the class right now, but one lap is all it takes around here, Fair as point. we know. So, Felipe Fraga put the car on pole position in very challenging conditions. Yesterday, the GT Le Mans cars and GT cars have just started their final lap. As to the line, the Cadillac curse at Rodeberga is broken and they take the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship weekend main event with people Durrani bringing the car home just a second and a half away in second for Harry Tignall and Ollie Jarvis. Renga van der Zander and Kevin Magnussen coming home in third for the 0-1 Cadillac team. Another four seconds further back. Uh, Philippe Nasser, excuse me, uh, in that car, who qualified that car yesterday in the, in the very difficult qualifying positions and did the opening stint par excellence. People Durrani finishing it off for the 31 team. It's going to be Colin Brown who will come through to take LMP3 already through the top three in LMP2. Aero Motorsport, Ryan DL. Five seconds only at the end as Ryan was uh, soft pedalling a wee bit. Gabby Aubrey brings Tower Motorsport home in second and Mikkel Jensen for PR1 Matheson Motorsport, 52 car in third. And we wait for Colin Brown. What's that? Cameron, the Meershank racing car, 2 or 5 on the last lap. Yeah, he's lost all that ground. Uh, that so he's was, fallen behind the... the, the uh, that was an out lap, uh, of course, wasn't it? That uh, last yeah, lap. Yeah, but... True. He was 13 right, in sector one. 112 in sector two and 39 in sector three so we yeah. lost seven seconds in the second and then five That's seconds right. in the last yeah, yeah. It's enough to lose in that position to the number 10 car was that strategic i wonder on, on behalf of acura ah could to, have been. to allow the kanika minolta car to go through could have been yeah the the, the, yeah, the gap has, has, has shrunk now it's only uh, what 43 points between first and second now actually less than that 
41 points because uh, Felipe Nasser and Pipo Durrani, with their second win in succession, will move up into second place, two points ahead of Oliver Jarvis and Harry Tickle. Wow. Uh, and uh, like I say, 41 points ahead of the uh, Nasser Durrani will be Ricky Taylor and uh, Philip Albuquerque. So you know, that was an extra 20 points they gained there by the fact that they that they moved ahead of the Maya Shank racing with Kerbag and Acura on that last lap. Yeah, so maybe the 60 car playing the Acura team game there. Just to confirm where the Tech Racing did win it, Matt Campbell, 207 last time around, but the Corvettes couldn't get back to him. So it is a win on home ground for WeatherTech Racing and for Porsche. Cooper McNeil and Matt Campbell take it over. Tonio Garcia and Corvette Racing, number three, with the four car in fourth position, Tom Milner and Nick Tandy. In GT Daytona, it's another Porsche victory. Faf Motorsport with the number nine car. Turner in second with the, th the 96. And two out of three on the podium in GTD for Wright Motorsports, the 16. That's the black and light blue car. Well, well, well. Just to finish off the uh, podium positions in LMP3, we mentioned Court Autosport winning that. It was uh, the Performance Tech Motorsport car in second, the 38 machine from in third, Felipe Fraga who for a moment I put in the wheel and engineering car, which was rather clever of him uh, as he was driving the Riley Motorsports LMP3. They came home in third position. He and uh, that was the car that started, of course, on pole position. The rain held off. Mother Nature has uh, done her best to spice up proceedings on Friday and Saturday. But for today and the main event, it was left to the drivers and the teams to sort their strategy out. And Cadillac take their first win in IMSA here at the fabulous four-mile Road America circuit. And it's closed up massively in the championship, as you heard Jeremy Shaw say there. Coming up next, we have Michelin Post Race Techs. Your comments, questions, points arising, please, to at IMSA Radio, hashtag Michelin PRT. Felipe Nazik getting a lift to victory lane from his teammate. Sitting on the side pod there as people to not Durrani drives the wheel and Cadillac in to the very very nice victory lane here. The IMSA Sports Car Weekend won by Whelan by Cadillac and by two very excited drivers. Jeremy Shaw, some thoughts for you before we hand the PA back to uh, our colleagues trackside. Yeah, just a, yeah, an exciting race, uh, an interesting race. No, not a great race probably. Uh, but uh, a, a tremendous performance, no question about it, by Wheel and Engineering Racing. Uh, Bipa Durrani and uh, s the f starting driver who made it all possible, by made it all easier by starting on the pole position, Felipe Nasser, a very, very well earned victory again for them. They're second in succession, and they, uh, that team is on a roll right now with just, what, uh, three races remaining in this season. The sound of excitement and celebration in the background as Matt Campbell also comes in. That's a great drive by him and by Cooper McNeil, who took, a, a, again, a very long run to the chequered flag. They take GTLM. The next time we see uh, Cooper McNeil and the WeatherTech Porsche will be at Le Mans. And Le Mans starts a week from today with Test Day. Haggerty Radio Le Mans fired up from early morning Central European time uh, on the 15th. That's next Sunday. And we'll take you through with unrivaled coverage. The only broadcaster to bring you test day and all of the sessions for the 24 hours. All free, all live and all without any blocks or breaks. Then we're back, of course, for IMSA and the final rounds of the season. Thank you very much for being with us. Tim Greer was our... 
uh, producer in London. Thanks to Alicia and the team in Charlotte, uh, uh, particularly to uh, Richie Basili, who was cutting the pictures for us so we could see around the track. The responsible adult was Eve Hewitt. Jeremy Shaw joined me, John Hindorf, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. And Shea Adam was our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter. We'll take a breath and be back with Michelin Post Race Tech on IMSA Radio RS2 in just a moment.